back. My name is Dean, and uh, this is going to be a weird podcast. Not a weird podcast. It'll be weird if you, you know, traditionally expect uh, us to come on here and uh, fight fire with fire, tell some jokes about people that do the weird stuff, uh, get into some uh, questionable material, because we like to make fun of the news and the way things work in this world. But uh, over the past few years, and I've been really fortunate to uh, have uh, gotten into some pretty life-changing perspectives through philosophy. Um, you know, long story short, and I think a lot of people kind of know about my history uh, because I write about it openly. I talk about it openly uh, from a time five years ago, almost to the month where I decided to kind of needed to get my shit together. I quit drinking and that wasn't enough. And then I had to figure out what am I doing with the rest of my life? Do I still feel the same way I feel about things? How can I make my life a little bit better? How can I make my life uh, one of those lives where I used to really respect the people that seemed to be able to stoically go through life where bad things would happen to them and they would seemingly be completely unaffected, be able to plod through it and not be this affected, weird mess that I seemed to be about five years ago. Uh, enter stoicism through a conversation I had with a friend of mine. His name's Hank, who uh, is a wonderful guy. He was on the same journey. And, and I was talking with him and I'm like, dude, Hank, I, I, what I really want, and I was about two years sober at this time, what I really want is I want like this thing in my life that teaches me how to not be a trigger show. I wanted something in my life that would teach me how to be able to manage life, how to respond to life, how to figure life out that A, had nothing to do with religion or born again Christianity, which I grew up in, which I knew was a dodgy situation, if you will. And I also wanted it to be something that relieved me of the tensions of life, inner stoicism. Um, and over the past, I would say, three years, I have had my head in as many books as I can. And um, through a series of events, I came to know our next guest. And this is a solo interview one on one. I haven't done one of these yet because I'm new to it. And so there's this like uh, there's this there's this feeling that you may get it wrong when you start talking about something that you uh, hold in such high esteem and you start talking about something with other people who know so much more about it. But I've been fortunate because stoicism is one of those things that people take time to teach you about. It's like an operating system. And one of those guys that I have absolutely gleaned as much information as I can from over the past several years uh, has been a gentleman by the name of Donald J. Robertson. Now, Donald is the founder of a couple of different organizations, one which is incredible. I sent it to everybody who wants to talk about this kind of stuff. Uh, it's called uh, modernstoicism.com. Now, not only is he the founder of Modern Stoicism, which is just its incredible resource center for the operating system with which I use uh, Stoicism 4, uh, it's also this community and a community of people that also felt the same way I think I did or people that got the advantage of actually getting into philosophy and getting into the, the cardinals, and getting into the ancient classics. Uh, and over the past, I would say two, three years, it's exploded. And it's not because I've advocated for it. It's not because I appreciate it. It's because it actually works. And I'm joined today by author, uh, stoic thinker, CBT therapist, and psychotherapist. Please welcome my friend uh, Donald J. Robertson. Mr. Robertson, what a pleasure it is to see you on my screen today. This is wild for me. Well, it's wild for me as well. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm really like looking. I'm as excited as a young stoic can be about our <laughs> chat today and for all you guys to get into stoicism. We'll have you all walking around barefoot, yeah, yeah. And holes and stuff, but then uh, facing adversity, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. It was weird how we we kind of got got connected because I followed you as a result of my introduction to stoicism. So again, I mean, I a, a little thing off the top where I said, you know, I got in, introduced to it by a friend of mine who was just listening to me, and he's like, "Oh, what you need is this book," and it was called "Ego Is the Enemy" by Ryan Holiday, who's a colleague of yours, mm -hmm. and I read it. And I was, my mind was blown. And it's just funny because when he sent it to me, I opened up the box and I'm looking at it. I'm like, who sent this to me? Who says I have an ego? <laughs> I was actually turned off and angry when I saw it. And then I read it and it was almost like lights went off with each passage, right? Every time I read something uh, that Epictetus had said about, you know, and, and this was really the one, the one uh, line or the one quote which which opened up my eyes it was we're not bothered by things we're bothered by the perception we take of things and i thought that's me that's me every day all day i walk around like a trigger show um and so that got me into like i said ego is the enemy obstacles away i went backwards did stillness is the key and then i was interested to in, in, then i was introduced to this book which again took it to another level it's your book it's called how to think like a roman emperor the stoic philosophy of marcus aurelius 
Um, and that got me into, oh, that's a different, <laughs> sorry, that's Hunter Biden. Pardon me. That's for the next show. Um, but that got me into another uh, series of books that you wrote and, and on, on the art of happiness and, and stoic philosophy. Um, and, and it was, it was interesting because when I look back on the history of, of philosophy and I, I look to talk to different people like yourself, or I look to people like yourself to read your material, I get into a, a situation where I'm like, my God, I can't believe I walked around this ignorant for this long. Does, do people talk to you about that in stoicism when you talk about stoicism with them? Yeah, it's usually me. Like I, like I, I, it seems weird to me because um, when I was a young guy, I was incredibly angry a lot of the time. Um, I kind of dropped out of school and stuff like that. I was in a lot of trouble when I was a teenager. And I look back now and I think, geez, why was I so angry? And stoicism, I think, really transformed my personality, you know, I hope in a good way. And uh, a lot of it I take for granted now. It starts off as a struggle learning some of these strategies and techniques. But really, after a while, after years, it just starts to become very familiar to you. Mm -hmm. right? And that, that's a pretty cool feeling. Yeah, it is. Um, and it's kind of the theme behind your new book, which is, you know, how we got in touch with each other is I followed you. You said, hey, can, can you want to talk about my book? And I'm like, I would love to. It's called Verissimus. And it's a it's a different book for you, isn't it? Like it's you're you've written a ton of novels. You've written a bunch of handbook and CBT books. But this is a graphic novel and it and um, and it's 25 years in the making. And it's the most accessible book on the philosophy of stoicism and the life of Marcus Aurelius that I've seen so far, Donald. I think it's tremendous. It's got pictures in it. Yeah. Like, that's the big difference. <laughs> like, so I, it was a complete shocker to me. Like I, I didn't know anything about graphic novels. Mm -hmm. I was a total ignoramus when, when it comes to graphic novels. And it's happened sometimes in publishing. I was just kind of invited to do this project. Basically, I sort of stumbled into it. And then I educated myself. I went and read those books that tell you how to do it. The best one is Scott McCloud's Making Comics, by the way. It's awesome. I read that like three times cover to cover. And I learned about the art of doing a graphic novel. And it's often the case when you panic and think, geez, I better learn how to do this properly. Like, I don't know anything about it. Then you start doing it. And you and then you look at examples of things that other people have done. And you go, hang on a minute. I don't think most of these other guys actually read the, the book on how to do it. You know, I started looking at examples of other graphic novels and I realized that often they were quite, sim you know, the approach they took was pretty simplistic. We put way more effort into planning it and thinking about it and structuring it. We used a lot more tricks of the trade and stuff like that. I think it was because we were going into it naively and we felt we, we kind of needed to pull our socks up and, you know, and learn the trade pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was it was it weird? Like, where did you get the idea for it? Because, you know, in terms of uh, the books that you've written on not just the stoicism, the art of happiness, uh, how to think like a Roman, build your resilience, which I have not read yet, which I ordered this morning because I was going through the prep work for this. I'm like, ooh, add that one to the list. Build your resilience. That's me. I need that. Uh, but it's so much like stoicism and the people that write it where, you know, it, it's about that response to this unmanageable world, which is today. Yeah. everything right you know we can't manage anything we can't manage our way through an election we can't manage our way through anything and if that response and teaching people that response this graphic novel it, it, it's that accessible sort of foray into stoicism for people who are like listen i need to see it it needs to be tactile uh but it needs to be introductory and and what was that kind of the thinking behind it or was it just like a yeah. hey i met this guy he's a great artist we just decided to do this great book well, there's several, well, like all things, you know, there's kind of multiple reasons. One is I just met this guy and he was a great artist and he wanted to do a book. And another <laughs> one is it always bugged me that I, I always really liked Gladiator, the movie, right? Yeah. With Russell Crowe. And I thought, because Marcus Aurelius is played by Richard Harris in Act One of Gladiator. And I thought there's little, one or two like fleeting references to stoicism. And I thought, how much cooler would it be if there was like a bit more, just like a little bit more philosophy in Gladiator? That would be awesome. So I, I kind of always wanted to do a kind of prequel to Gladiator or something or something a bit like that with all the action and stuff and the drama, but that had more of a message in it about a philosophy of life. Um, and so, yeah, like that's what inspired me to get into to doing this. And it was a lot of fun. Mm. Yeah, it's different, though, you know, and I shared it with a friend of mine because I just got the book and it's actually right here. Uh, it's it's a it is a thick piece of work. Like there's a lot of glossy stuff that goes on in this. There's a lot of great um, uh, imagery. Obviously, the illustration's incredible, but it's the first time, like you know, for for someone like me that that is again new to stoicism, it has for the past yeah. three years. It's the first time that I've been able to kind of put the words into 
into view with the people who are of the day, you know, and I, and, and that's what I really appreciated about it. Again, it made it more tactile to me. Was that the goal? I hope it reaches a different audience for sure. Yeah. Like, you know, I just as an aside about that, like in, in the ancient world, there were lectures on philosophy and the dialogues about philosophy and stuff like that. But people learned about philosophy in antiquity, in ancient Greece and Rome, through satires, through comedies and through anecdotes and stuff like that. And we don't really have that as much anymore. Like, so when I started doing this, I thought there's something weirdly familiar about it. Like, the, this is kind of like reinstating a tradition that actually already existed in the ancient world that brought philosophy to a much wider audience by kind of making it more entertaining. Um, and I think there could be a lot more of that today, like for sure. Like people are interested in this stuff, but it can be tied in with the action and the adventure more. Um, people say to me, because it's a graphic novel, like people that don't know much about these things often say, is it for kids? I'm going to buy it and give it to my kids and stuff. And I'm like, well, there's like crucifixion in it and a lot of war. And there's guys in a cemetery contemplating their own mortality. Yeah, and Hadrian and like, in the first and chapter, yeah, Hadrian, Hadrian. Hadrian gives it to some dude in the eye. Like, I mean, you know, if you read, like yeah. it is the, it is, and it is like literally in the first few pages, it's pretty graphic, but it's what is incredible too, right? There's That's supernatural what horror in it and, yeah. and stuff like, but I mean, but then again, I say that to people and they're like, yeah, my kids like stuff like that. So I think maybe times have changed or something. They're like, they'll think that's awesome. I'm getting it for Christmas. Like, so yeah, I, I would think it's a little bit PG is my kind of compromise on it. Like, it is. It is. But, you know, it deals with it deals with two things I find. And one of them is very specific to the theme that we see today kind of in 2022. Right. It deals with the, the anger, like uncontrollable yeah. anger, how to control your anger. And, and the amazing part is, is that the illustrative portions of you bringing this to life are incredible, but the appendix actually teaches you how to put it into action, too. Yeah. I, when we started off, right, I said a couple of things. I, I thought, I don't want this just to be like two guys in sandals talking mm -hmm. to each other for 200 pages. I thought that's going to be really boring. So I thought, uh, we tried really hard to think, how can we make it really dynamic and action-packed? And I think we succeeded in doing that because Marcus's life is very dramatic and very action-packed. We tried to make it like an epic Sword and Sandals movie, but we also wanted to make sure there was enough philosophy in it that people could take practical advice away so that someone that's maybe never read any books on philosophy might read that and think, oh, I just like all the fighting and the gladiators and stuff like that. But they might also think, but that thing that that dude said about anger kind of stuck in my head and got me thinking, like, you know, plants a seed or something like that. That's really what I wanted, just to plant a few seeds in the minds of people that maybe wouldn't normally read self-help books or philosophy books. And I, I hope that we've achieved that. And anger was a big uh, concern for the Stoics. They thought it's the main thing that we should be focusing on. I agree. I call anger the royal road to self-improvement. And I'll tell you exactly why. In therapy, there are three main categories of negative emotion. Like, we usually kind of broadly categorize them into fear, sadness and anger now therapy consulting rooms are full of people experiencing anxiety and sadness or depression but people tend not to self-refer for anger they're more likely to be referred by a spouse or if they're in an institution like the military or a prison or a school other people might say you need to go for anger management buddy but the angry person will typically say no it's not me that's got a problem it's you guys you all need therapy not me so angry people, it's an externalizing emotion. They tend not to seek therapy. And that means that anger is under-treated as a, an emotional problem, as a self-improvement problem. It's where all the opportunity lies. And the internet is awash with self-help advice at the moment. And a lot of it's pretty superficial. And some of it's quite counterproductive. But you know, often you'll find that the people that spend all day long talking about self-help and self-improvement stuff are the ones that just seem to be getting angrier and angrier. Because the one thing that they'll typically have a blind spot for is addressing their own anger, bitterness, resentment, outrage, and all that kind of stuff. Mm. Yeah, and you know, and and I heard it explained once, and I, I know it was just Tim Ferriss that used this term, um, but stoicism is, to, to him, and, it, and I think it was a great explanation, an operating system, right? Yeah. It's, 
it it provides you the tips, the tools, the tricks to be able to put in your quiver, to be able to operate in this world. And if you've read the meditations, you understand that the meditations by Marcus Aurelius is this document that no one's supposed to read. It's like his journal. And it was his operating system. It was how he had to talk about the way and, and, and where he expressed himself, expressed his his issues with anger. And he was and he and he always was this angry guy or you know, like everybody was talked about how angry he was. But they're really, you know, when you read about it, there's really no recorded example of him losing his mind in public or being an angry person because the the 10 different uh articles or policies or tips or tricks that marcus aurelius gives you in the meditations are things that worked for him and and it was and it's this incredible story of modeling behavior almost which is what really comes through in verissimus as well he says that he had a problem with anger but everyone Mm -hmm. else said that he would be like completely you know, composed of someone, a guy tried to, a famous, a guy that's famous today, Herodes Atticus, who's like the Elon Musk or the Jeff Bezos of his day, he was a billionaire, like he was kind of a philanthropist. The Foo Fighters played a concert not long ago at his, uh, the Odeon of Herodes Atticus on the slopes of the Acropolis. He's still a famous name today in Athens. Herodes Atticus was a famous sophist, an orator in ancient Greece. He lunged at Marcus Aurelius and tried to throttle him during a court case. And Marcus allegedly just stood up completely composed and dismissed everybody, adjourned the hearing, like because he wasn't easily ruffled by anything that happened to him. But internally, he said that he had this struggle with anger and he was constantly working on it. The Meditations was written after he'd been studying in Stoicism, training in it and practicing it probably every day, from what he says, for about four decades, right? Mm-hmm. He'd been practicing almost like a yoga, training himself in stoicism for four decades before he even began writing that book. So I think it's very interesting what we're getting the benefits of a lot of work that he's been doing on himself. And it sounds like he was successful in managing his anger from the way that people describe his his behavior. He thought he had a real responsibility to do that because he thought, if I lose my cool, I'm going to make bad decisions. Right? And if I'm going to be emperor of Rome, he saw it as a huge responsibility. He thought, I, he, you know, mainly he thought I, he needs to think clearly like, and not, uh, you know, lose his temper because then he might do things that he regrets. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, and that comes out in, in not just Verismus, but like if you if you kind of uh, spend some time in, in the meditations or if you spend some time reading about Marcus Aurelius is that, you know, he was self-admittedly uh, always in the meditations talking about the things that he was working on all the time. It was his journal. Right. Um, but you don't have any examples of him breaching um, some of his training. I mean, I'm sure there are. Obviously, there's gaps in history, and you actually mentioned it in Verismus, but we don't see that, and and which is what makes it incredible to to me because it would have been so much more difficult for a guy like him to have the mantle that he had and, and wearing the purple robes, which he never wanted. And um, you know, if you want a study and a model of how to be when you have every reason not to be a good human being, when you have every reason not to experience the fruit of this life, Marcus really is it, right? I mean, is yeah. that, it, it, it has to be the reason, and I don't know if I would call your yeah. love of the, the you know, Marcus Aurelius and his writings obsession, but it, 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 it kind of appears to be that way. It's like, man, this is kind of the example. And it's amazing because it's touched off this massive wildfire of people who go, that's my guy. Like there's people walking around with Marcus Aurelius tattoos. There's Marcus Aurelius t-shirts yeah. popping up all over the place. You can't even. It's like, crazy, right? Yeah. I say that at conferences about therapy. Uh, Cause one of the things I think the value, one of the values of stoicism is cognitive therapy. So I'm a cognitive behavioral therapist by trade. And uh, we use cognitive behavioral therapy as the basis for what we call resilience training, mm-hmm. which is preventative like uh, training. You know, therapists like me, we're Johnny come lately in the scene. By the time we arrive, it's too late. Somebody's already got a problem, and then we have to try and fix them, right? Mm. But it would be better if they just didn't have a problem in the first place. You know, prevention is definitely better than cure. So could we train people to make themselves more resilient so they're less likely to develop depression or anxiety disorders in the future? Well, we can by taking bits of CBT and adapting it. But what the research shows is that after a couple of years, they kind of forget to do the exercises and stuff. And so the effect of the training wears off. You have to keep doing refresher courses. So the holy grail of mental health would be a form of resilience training that resembles CBT, but is somehow permanent, like lifelong. And stoicism, I think, is the closest thing that we have to that. And when I'm talking to the therapist, the way that I illustrate that is I'll, I'll sometimes I'll put up a slide with loads of pictures of guys with stoic tattoos. 
And I'm like, I've never met anybody with an Albert Ellis or an R&T Beck tattoo, like the founders. Uh, I say, you guys proved me wrong, right? But have you ever met anyone that's got Albert Ellis's face tattooed on them or something like that? Like, I've never seen it, but there are, people keep sending me stoic tattoos, right? And uh, the point being that these guys identify with this, like it's a yoga, like it's Buddhism or something. It's almost like a religion. But more accurately, it's a philosophy of life to them. And so it's something that they get into, and they it's not just for, you know, stoicism for life, not just for Christmas. They stay in stoicism permanently. And that's like gold dust in psychotherapy terms. If, that, if it actually has ideas in it that resemble CBT and people identify with it at that level, it, you know, like we can't replicate that by using evidence-based techniques alone because they're too boring. Like nobody, well, we give somebody a book on CBT, they'll read it. They're not going to read it 20 years later. Like they're not going to keep reading it every year, but people that get into the meditations keep going back to it and keep revisiting the techniques, and that's actually incredibly important. Yeah, but how did how did because you're you're a cognitive behavioral therapist, psychotherapist. So you're you're this that was your training 25 years ago. You you got into stoicism, yeah. but what is the connection between the two? Because they're not just connected. Uh, you know, when you read. Uh, stoic classics and you read about stoicism and you get the popularization from certain people like yourself uh, that have the ability to make it, uh, you know, digestible to the point where you can actually put those words into works. CBT is stoicism and stoicism is the original CBT. Like I'm shocked at how not just relevant stoicism is to people as an operating system. I am shocked at how it's the antidote for a lot of the stuff that we see today that is, not yeah. the fruit of this life, not people of good character, and not acts for the common good. Well, like it shocks a lot of people. I'll tell you some things that people won't believe, right? So one of them is that psychotherapy isn't a new thing. Like psychotherapy existed in ancient Greece and ancient Rome. They called it therapy of the psyche. In the beginning of meditations, Marcus Aurelius says that one of the transforming points in his life was when his main Stoic mentor, a guy called Junius Rusticus, to, it convinced him that he needed to undergo stoic therapy, like stoic psychotherapy. And the Stoics wrote books called On Therapeutics, On Psychological Therapy. We have one of them that still survives today by Seneca, like on the psychotherapy of anger, that's called On Anger, it's still incredibly relevant today. But the main thing that the Stoics contributed, like goes back to their kind of godfather, their predecessor, Socrates, is like the most iconic, the quintessential Athenian philosopher. And Socrates introduced this cognitive theory of emotion that we normally think that emotions are here and reason is here and they're kind of like two dogs fighting or something like that. And the Stoics following Socrates said, that's all wrong. Like emotion is a type of thinking. Our emotions are shaped by our beliefs. Like they contain thoughts. They're not two separate things. Albert Ellis, who was the original pioneer of modern psychotherapy, or modern cognitive therapy, when his clients would come into therapy, they talk about how they were depressed or anxious or angry, and then they're usually clients will talk a lot about how it's ruining their lives, it's damaging their relationship, it's making them physically ill, it's giving them stomach ulcers or whatever, it's affecting their performance at work, it's making them miserable. Duh, 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 duh. And these are all reasons to do something about it. And then the client will usually express stuckness. They'll say, I know this is terrible. I know it's ruining my life, my depression, my anxiety, my anger, or whatever, but I can't help it. It's just the way I feel. And that's like a move that people make verbally that expresses stuckness. There's nothing to do about it. It's just how I feel. I just feel depressed. I just feel angry. And Ellis used to lean forward and he'd smile and he'd say, yeah, but it's not just how you feel, is it? It's also how you think. Mm -hmm. And that is the origin of cognitive therapy. Our thoughts shape our anger. Our anxiety and that's crucial because thoughts have truth value they could be true or false your thoughts could be mistaken if you say it's just how i feel then nobody can question your feelings or you go okay well i guess you're entitled to feel anxious mm -hmm. and depressed or whatever but what if you're depressed about something that's not true or what if you're depressed about something that doesn't exist or what if you're depressed about something that's a half truth or a distortion of reality then those underlying beliefs deserve to be brought out into the light of day. Sunlight's the best antiseptic. Mm -hmm. Brought out into the sunlight and questioned critically. And that's what Socrates did and what the Stoics did. And it's the basis. It's sort of what we call the cognitive revolution in psychotherapy was in it when Ellis began doing that. And people couldn't just kind of hide in the corner with their feelings. He said, no, your feelings are beliefs and some of them are false. Ellis would go further and say, some of these beliefs are crazy bullshit. 
Like we all have it. Like you know, we believe stuff that's completely fictional, and we we should be questioning these beliefs. That's what we do in cognitive therapy. Yeah, because um, of the skeptics. Well, it, and it does, right? Like it, um, and again, I go back to Epictetus. We're not bothered by things. We're bothered by the perception we have of things. I cannot tell you how many times I have been wrought with fear and anger. You know why that's so famous is because Ellis took that quote from Epictetus and he put it in pretty much every book he wrote, and he wrote dozens and dozens of books. He taught it to all of his clients in therapy and all of his students. So when I started training in CBT, that was a cliche. Like, everybody knew this quote. It's not things that upset us, but rather our opinions about them. It's the central psychological principle of stoicism. And it articulates what we call the cognitive theory of emotion. Mm -hmm. Like, And El thought, well, in cognitive therapy, we take all the scientific research, and then we have this headache of how do we explain this to this wee guy that just walked off the bus and came in our consulting room, or this elderly Jewish lady you know, or that, you know, whoever, whatever random people are in your consulting room, how are we going to explain all this statistical research and stuff? And we have to have what we call a kind of a simplified like version, a layman's version of it. So the job of a psychotherapist is a job of translation in a way. And Ellis thought, well, the easiest way to do it is just to tell them this quote from Epictetus, because basically that sums up what all the research shows about how emotions work. And that's how that quote became famous. And it's partly why from about the 1950s onwards, the gradually stoicism began to resurface. And then its popularity really started to break through into the mainstream about 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it feels, does it feel kind of like the world came to you because you started getting into this stuff like 25 years ago? Because it's yeah. got to be weird watching the explosion of the common sense behind you, this philosophy. Think, Dina, are you saying that I was into stoicism before it was cool? Yeah. Like, because far be it from me to say that. Like, <laughs> but I was, it makes me feel old now. But I was kind of, not for long, it was only a couple yeah. of years and then it started to become cool. But honestly, man, I kid you not, when I started doing research on stoicism, my friends that were doing philosophy. Yeah, but you would have, 25 why? years ago, I would have said you were psycho. Like, if you showed yeah. up and said, hey, you got to check out this stuff, Marcus, really, 2000 years, this guy had to use on No one's interested. Like, yeah. Exactly. Why are you wasting your time on that stuff when no yeah. one's interested in it? And then it kind of Ryan Holiday's books come out and uh, stuff that Tim Ferriss got into it, and suddenly it became like weirdly cool. Um, so I was very lucky in that regard. I'd still be into stoicism today if it hadn't have become trendy. But when I started reading it, people thought I was crazy because they thought it was this obscure, nerdy niche subject that no one cared totally. about. Totally. There was like, and it wasn't reticence. I love, sh I love talking about things that help other people and the things that I've been able to find along the way that have helped change my perspective. Because listen, this isn't a religion. Stoicism has nothing to do with God. And thank God, because I was a born again crow. I was involved in born again Christianity when I was a kid, forced into it, born into it, all that other stuff. And um, there's a common sense here. And if you've been a part of any religion or if you've been subjected to a religion, you know that there's like no run. The runway goes just off the cliff, like in, in terms of understanding and and whose job it is to be a happy individual. It's not left up to anybody but yourself, which is what stoicism is to me. It's this thing where it's like this this understanding that you come into about the objective reality of your life never being as bad as it is and also how to respond when it is as bad as it should be right like how do we yeah. get through these things and in, in in religion specifically christianity it was like hey man just lay it at the feet of god and tomorrow say a prayer tomorrow you wake up you're gonna be good this is literally about the active ability to be able to frame things in a in a proper way so that you you yourself can manage your way through almost every bad thing that happens in your life. And that is the best way I can kind of describe it. And I know I'm describing it to the goat, but I apologize. Well, I'm going to tell you something about stoicism. It's a criticism of it, but it's a criticism you're probably going to like then. Like, so the early Christians had a weird relationship with stoicism. Like, the Stoics are in the Bible, weirdly. Oh, yeah. Like, they're in the New Testament. They're mentioned. Uh, St. Paul goes and preaches a sermon to them, and they're like, yeah, whatever, dude. Like, but he well, goes wasn't, and, wasn't it Seneca's brother that pardoned yes, Paul Seneca's as well? Seneca's brother is in the yeah. New Testament as well, but there's also yeah. a bit, another bit where uh, Paul preaches to them. Um, and the early Christian, the church fathers had kind of studied Stoicism, so they kind of took bits of it, but they also criticized it. There's always been this kind of sort of love-hate relationship that, that the Christians had with uh, the Stoics. But the, the main criticism they made of the Stoics was for pride. They said, you guys are too prideful. And the Stoics were like, what are you talking about, buddy? And the church fathers were like, well, because you believe that you can save yourselves. 
Like the, you can take control of your lives by studying philosophy. You can improve your character and stuff. And you cannot do that except by the grace of God, right? So you believing that you can take responsibility for your own lives is prideful. It's arrogant, and that's a sin. And that was the main criticism they made of him. Whereas nowadays, most atheists and agnostics would be like, ah, actually, we're fine with that. Like, it's not a big deal. Like, if your main criticism of us is that we're taking too much personal responsibility, that doesn't really seem that much of a... So your alternative <laughs> is that we should be like... You guys are too accountable. Way yeah, too accountable for us. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, like, you need to you need to lay it at the feet of God more. Like, stop thinking that you can take control of your own life. No. Like, no one believes that anymore. And just as an aside, you know, how people get into Stoicism, like, I've, I've worked with, I had the good fortune to work with so many people, thousands of people over the years at conferences and stuff that talk about Stoicism. And so sometimes I have the privilege of just telling you what they've told me. Like, it makes my job really easy. So what people tell me about why they get into Stoicism is that they see it as a Western alternative to Buddhism. So they're like, I, I kind of like Buddhism, but it's a bit exotic for me. And I kind of like Stoicism because it, resonates with my cultural norms and values like it kind of it has a deja vu value i recognize bits of it that's what some people will say other people will say oh, i liked academic philosophy but it's too abstract stoicism seems like academic philosophy but more down to earth or they'll say oh, i kind of like cbt and i like self-help but i want something bigger like more of a philosophy of life something more ambitious in scope so stoicism gives them something like cbt but it's much bigger and more ambitious in scope or they say kind of what you've been saying which is that Stoicism gives them a secular alternative to Christianity. Mm. So they say, look, there's things about Christianity I kind of like. You know, I sort of like this idea of having a, a whole philosophy of life that guides you and stuff like that. And I like the kind of emphasis on virtue and stuff like that. But I'm not really into jumble sales and singing hymns and prayers and all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, so you can keep that. And so the Stoics weirdly is very popular with atheists and agnostics today although there's a paradox here which is the stoics did worship zeus right however they even in the ancient world it was seen as kind of ambiguous because they were pantheists so the stoics thought that they should abolish temples which by implication means abolishing the priesthood right and their argument for that was we don't need all that stuff because we believe that God is everywhere. Like the whole universe is kind of sacred. Yeah, it's nature, reality. the fate. Yeah, right? nature is sacred, right? Yeah. And they said, and so everything that we do is the will of God. And so if we want kind of divine guidance, we'll just look inside ourselves. For thanks very much. We don't need to go and ask a priest. No. Like, so they basically effectively, but so they were criticized in the ancient world as being agnostic or atheists, even. Like, and the Stoics would say, well, it's more, it's just that we've got a radically different idea about religion. But they were open-minded about it. I think the key thing is that Stoics thought that what they were doing was a philosophy, not a religion. Yeah. So although they did worship Zeus and they carried out rituals, some of that they interpreted metaphorically. Like some of the Stoics write books about how the gods are just metaphors for human achievements. Mm -hmm. Like there's a god of writing that's just because we're celebrating writing. Or there's a god of like different aspects of nature are symbolized by the gods. So they had this symbolic interpretation of the myths sometimes. So they were questioning it, not taking things too literally. But more fundamentally, they said, we do not get this stuff from scriptures, right? Mm -hmm. We can justify our worldview, our psychology, and our ethic rationally. Like we do it by looking within ourselves and reasoning about the nature of life. We don't need scripture or revelation or anything to do that even though it's normal in our society to worship Zeus and carry out rituals and stuff like that. And I think that's why modern atheists connect with it. Like, because the Stoics will say, you know, we're doing these things because they're psychologically healthy or because it seems rational to live this way, not because God's told us to do it. Mm -hmm. They think that's fundamentally unphilosophical. Like, it's not a good reason for doing stuff. And they, you know, they're, they're averse to that. That's the only reason I do things. Like, you know, you no, no, no. <laughs> uh, the only reason I do things and, and it, it sounds crazy, but it's this filter that I run our business through as well. Uh, the fruit of this uh, life is, uh, and I've said it three, four times already, is uh, being of good character and acts for the common good. Um, you know, and when I'm when I'm getting ready to send that tweet that I know I shouldn't send yeah. or I'm getting ready to post something that's probably more divisive than it should be. That actually has helped me. Uh, just that one phrase, just that one verse is like, you know, you, you 
you go back when you go into the work, you go back and you read about the differences between the Christians and, and the Stoics. And then you look at, at today and you've got a whole mess of people, this theocratic movement, which I'm sure Marcus saw bubbling up and, you know, yeah. through his time of it, it, it's a very it's a very similar set of circumstances. And I imagine, you know, being in Marcus's footsteps, he's like, hey, listen, this is like a and, and every Stoics. Um, you know, desire for for their for their civilization back in the day was was to uh, to enable people to live empowered lives where they were not bothered by things they didn't need to be bothered by and also be able to know simply what they did control and what they did not control, which was, you know, very different than what Christianity is and what it was back then. It was like, hey, you're nothing without the big guy. And, uh, and you know, also you want the thing the Stoics would have picked on, which we don't, it doesn't get as much criticism today is just the doctrine of the afterlife, right? Mm -hmm. So to them, in the ancient world, the big novelty about Christianity, although there were things that had uh, predecessors of this, was this idea that life sucks, but if you pray and you go to church, you'll be rewarded uh, after a delay <laughs> like in the afterlife. You just got to hang around long enough. Just got like, to stick it out a bit. Yeah. Stick it out a bit and you'll get rewarded in the afterlife. And the Stoics were like, no. Like, you know... If there's any kind of value in life, it has to happen right now. Like, we've got to find a way to make life worth living here and now, regardless of the circumstances that we find ourselves in, because you cannot bank on getting some kind of pat on the back after you, after you peg it. Yeah. Like, you know, we don't really, we can't assume that that's going to happen. The Stoics didn't really believe in the afterlife in that sense. But the, let's get radical for a minute and talk Please. about... So really what the Stoics are saying is we come into this world bawling and screaming at children. We don't know what we're supposed to be doing. We look around us and we see adults and monkey see, monkey do. We copy their behavior, right? So we pick up their values based on observing their external behavior. So we see people running around trying to impress each other and try to make as much money as they can and stuff like that. So it's inevitable, the Stoics say, that we're going to grow up valuing external goods like wealth and reputation because that's what we see around us. We don't really understand why people began valuing these things or what their underlying motives are. We'd have to talk to them like, and, and have really deep conversations to get to their underlying motives. And that only happens if we're lucky like later on in life. So the Stoics think we make this big mistake by basing our lives around the pursuit of extrinsic value or what they call external goods. And they think we need to do an epistrophe. This is the Greek word for con religious conversion. It's kind of like a U-turn. We need to completely turn around, snap out of the trance and begin realizing what actually matters is our own character, mm -hmm. like wisdom, virtue, strength of character, who we actually are is more important than what we own or what other people think of us. And so the Stoics thought, look, what's really going to give you satisfaction, and this is this kind of pride in a sense as well, is being able to look in the mirror and to like yourself. The Stoics said it's about learning to befriend yourself, to build a relationship with yourself so that you you know, you know, don't hate yourself. Like, and you're not always trying to bury your head in drugs and alcohol and distractions and stuff. But you can look back on the day that you've uh, like, that, that's gone before and think, geez, I'm proud of what I did today. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm the sort of person that I'd like to be friends with or hang out with. The story say you get there by looking at the people you admire in life, figuring out what it is that you really admire about them, and then trying to embody some of those qualities yourself in, in your own life. It takes effort and reflection to do that. Now, they were, and I do not say this lightly, Dean, way ahead of their time mm. in that regard because it's only really over the past 20 years or so that psychotherapy based on behavioral psychology research has caught up with that the leading evidence-based treatment for clinical depression now which we call behavioral activation is based on a very very similar concept so depressed people typically their days are full of them doing stuff and if you ask them why are you watching tv why are you playing video games it's to avoid unpleasant feelings usually. It's what we call experiential avoidance because mm. I felt depressed or I felt bored or I felt crappy. So I just did this to kind of kill time or distract myself, right? That's kind of like a zombie existence though. Like you're just killing time basically. And people that are depressed fall into a trap of filling up their whole day with these kind of subtle avoidance strategies. Like, and what they're not doing are things that actually have intrinsic value to them. 
like things that they take pride in, like things that they have satisfaction from. If you say to a depressed person, what sort of people do you actually admire? Like what characters in movies do you genuinely admire? You know, what would you, you like to be remembered for after you died? You know, what, what's, what do you want your life to really be about? They might say creativity, friendship, courage, integrity, stuff like that, right? And if you say how much time yesterday or so far today have you actually spent living in accord with your core values as a clinician, I can tell you the most common answer to that question, and it shocked me, is zero, mm. right? Simple mm. as that. Not always, but the majority of people will say zero minutes I, yeah. I spent yesterday doing stuff. And, I, and you say, but that's the stuff that you said makes life worthwhile. Like, I mean, is this typical? And usually when people are depressed or they have certain types of anxiety disorders, that's pretty much the norm. But we all suffer from that to, to some extent. We sacrifice our intrinsic core values for doing all the other stuff that everyone else is doing around us, like the stuff that, that society wants us to do. And yeah. a lot of it is experiential avoidance. A lot of it is just because we're bored or we feel crappy, so we want to kind of bury our heads for a while. And Marcus really and the Stoics knew that, and they want to wrench us out of that kind of fog, like, you know, this kind of trance. They actually call it tifos in Greek, which means smoke or mist. They mm -hmm. want to drag us out of this kind of smoke and mirrors of the prevailing values of our society, all the consumerism and hedonism and narcissism and celebrity culture and all that. And they give us a shake and wake up and realize, you know, you've only got so much time left. Like, if you actually want to be able to have pride in yourself and look back in your life and think it was worthwhile at all, you need to really question what your core values are and put your foot down and make an effort to find time to actually live in accord with them. Mm. That's the message of the Stoics. Oh, man, that's so awesome. I'm so thankful you said that. We talk about values, right, and how I didn't really, you know, outside of Christianity, um, which gave you your values, it told you to live by a certain set of values or God would cry um or you wouldn't go to heaven one of the two uh but when it came it was like 35 36 37 i'm like i don't have a compass like yeah. i don't have anything that moors me to a behavior i don't have anything that moors me to being a better person i don't have anything that's telling me you need to look for those answers or here's where you go for those answers or here's a better way to look at strife or you know here's a better way to be reasonable here's a way that you can perceive the world around you and manage this world around you by managing yourself properly and putting your brain right and i, I would didn't say go ahead sorry go ahead like i mentioned in my book that you know like when i was a kid my father passed away when i was about 13 14 years old and I got booted out of school and kind of, I was on a rehabilitation scheme for young offenders when I was a young guy. Like, oh, really? Well, it's, it's amazing that stoicism, and like, it attracts all the guys yeah. who had a great time when they were younger. And it, it, if I told you where I was, I was just like, at school, they said, you have to pass your exams or you'll never get a job, right? Yeah. That absolutely drummed into us. Well, I failed all my exams when I got booted out of school, right? So that left me as a young guy thinking... Okay, so like, does that? I'm just on the rubbish heap of society. Then you've told, you've drummed that into me, right? Yeah, yeah. So what am I supposed to do? Like, and I, so I had no sense of direction, and I had no father figure to turn to. Right. And so by chance, I discovered philosophy, and I began reading Plato and stuff like that when I was pretty young. I read loads of books on different religions, but it was like philosophy. It was the kind of more rational, philosophical answer that I found interesting. And the answers to like this kind of moral compass question that the Stoics and Socrates give are really clever. Like Socrates knew that people will say, I don't know what my values are. Like, and he would do this trick um, that he does all the time. So Socrates typically begins by asking banal questions, right? And that's why people don't read. That's Plato. what got him killed, by the way. He wouldn't stop asking banal yeah, questions. He kept asking these questions, and that's what got him killed. They made him drink hemlock because he rocked the boat. Like, or politicians. He made the politicians look stupid, so they made yeah. him drink hemlock. Yeah. But he would, people don't read Plato's dialogues because they're quite long, and they usually start off with boring questions. So he'll say, he's talking to this kid in one of them called Critobulus, who's about 15. So he's actually just becoming a, an adult in Greek society. And he's the son of a wealthy friend of Socrates. And he comes to Socrates and says, listen, um, I want to, he basically says he wants to network. He says, I want to meet, you know, influential and important people and build up a kind of network of friends. And Socrates, you know everybody, like rich and poor in Athens. So I thought, you know, you could like introduce me to some of your friends. And Socrates says, well, what do you think, what sort of friends do you want? You know, like what would, what would, make a good friend in your eyes what's what are the ideal qualities 
that you would seek in a friend. And so far, this sounds kind of really banal. And they go through a list. They go, well, I guess like they'd lend me money if I was broke, or or maybe they'd tell me if I was making bad decisions in life. And Socrates like, ah, 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 ah. And so far, so humdrum, right? And but then Socrates does this old switcheroo thing where he suddenly kind of pulls the rug out from under people's feet and asks them a radical question. Yeah. So he says to this kid, having rattled off the list of all the qualities that he'd be looking for and an ideal friend and expecting Socrates to introduce him to these people. Socrates says, so uh, Critopolis, like how many of these qualities do you possess yourself? And there's like a silence, you know, like tumbleweed and Critopolis as well, like, well, not many, like, <laughs> of them, like none, I guess. Like, and Socrates says, do you know, you've got this completely back to front, right? Yeah. Like, he goes, so you, someone who has none of the qualities of a good friend, you'd want me to introduce to people who have. And he goes, in order to do that, I'd have to deceive them, right? And so then that's not going to end well for anyone. They're going to figure out eventually. They're never going to trust my advice again about introducing them to people. And he goes, you've got it all back to front. He goes, you should have come to me and said, how do I become a good friend? You should be as you wish to appear. Socrates mm. said, you're focusing too much on appearances. Dun, 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 like everything in modern society he goes you come saying how could i how could you make me appear like a good friend like you should say how do i actually become a good mm. friend how do i become generous and creative and intelligent and self-disciplined and all those good qualities that you admire in other people and really what socrates is saying to this kid is you have a moral compass mm -hmm. you just kind of forgotten where it was like you've just told me really clearly what the qualities are that you think are important in life, but you'd completely neglected to actually cultivate any of them yourself. You're perfectly capable of telling me where true north is morally. Like, and yet you'd somehow got really confused about it. Like, come back tomorrow and let's start talking about how you could become the type of good friend that you just described and how you could actually exhibit some of the qualities that you already know are important to becoming a good person. So that's incredibly important to me because the world is full of people who say that they don't know right from wrong. Mm -hmm. Like they don't know what the point of anything is. People who suffer from depression will typically say, I don't understand what the point of life is. You know, I don't see the purpose of it. But if you ask them the right questions, it becomes clear that they all do have a sense of these moral values and virtues, the qualities they admire. They just need to start recognizing that and implementing it. That's one of the big insights of the Stoics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, it, it's absolutely in Verissimus, by the way. We're talking with Donald J. Robertson, uh, at Don J. Robertson on Twitter is where you can find him. All of his particulars, including modernstoicism.com uh, and uh, his homepage, which is Donald J. Robertson slash name, or dot name, I believe, is where you can find him. Uh, graphic novel we're talking about. We're kind of getting into the weeds about stoicism as an operating system for your life and how important it is and how relevant it is today. And you say far beyond. Uh, anything that, they, you know, they're so light years ahead of where we are now. I mean, you know, I heard you on a podcast. I think it was on Modern... Modern Wisdom. Modern Wisdom podcast with Chris. I was listening to that the other day because I'm a big fan of his, and I was going through him like, I got Donald on the show. I'm getting prepping for the show, and I'm listening to it. And um, and it was imp and it was impressed upon me in that podcast how light years ahead yes. of everything, including Freud, right, yeah. Who, who turns out to be like literally all he did was interpret his dreams and go, hey, this is kind of how everything's supposed yeah. to go. But it, like it, it is it is it just stands the test of time. Everything in stoicism when it reverts to values and the perception you have of values and curing the duplicity, which I found was really a huge part of my ongoing success in life or my my better perspective in life. It's being that one person. And and mm -hmm. stoicism really encourages people to be that one person and to look at the common sense arguments around being a good person who makes good decisions and wants to have a beautiful life, which is continually driven through, you know, all of Epictetus's work, all of Seneca's work. I know Seneca is an interesting personality in the history of stoicism, but but the facts remain the same that it's it's self guided. Right. Like it's it's got yeah. nothing to do with anybody but you. We've got to have a reason for becoming good, like decent human beings, apart from believing in a big bearded guy in the sky, right? Like sky daddy thing. Like there's got to be another reason for wanting to be like half decent, pre like humans. humans. Yeah. yeah. Like, like you're not going to lose your seat in the afterlife. Like that's not yeah. a reason to be a good person today for anybody. Yeah. I mean, like. So the Stoics give us a, a system, a philosophy for doing that. And it goes really back. The, the Stoics are 
you know, the grandchildren of Socrates, like to a large extent, they're, they're drawing on Socrates. Somebody asked me recently what Marcus Aurelius would say if he kind of teleported into the present day. Please. And I, I thought about that. Um, and I think I can get away with saying now, like we've said a bit more about Stoicism, because this might shock people. But in all honesty, I think Marcus Aurelius would look around and think, they're all really stupid. Like, he'd think, I, and I mean that quite sincerely. I Ignorable. really, I, tr I tried to visualize it, and I thought yeah. he would. Yeah. He would think we're really gullible. Like, yeah. he'd be amazed. So it's true, as someone pointed out, like, not all Romans were educated, but he would say, compared to educated Greeks and Romans of his kind of class, he'd say, people in the future are all as thick as two short planks. Like, we think we're living in an idiocracy, like, literally. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll, I'll back that up by saying, Marcus had spent his life studying dialectic or logic, right? And he'd spent four decades um, studying rhetoric, like the persuasive use of language, under the leading Greek and Latin experts of his age, like way beyond anything that we would normally consider uh, like a university education or something like that, right? These guys took it for granted that they, at a technical level, could, un could spot manipulative ar arguments, illogical arguments, like like fallacies, like the ad hominem fallacy, like overgeneralization, affirming the consequent, formal logical fallacies, right? They would understand what's a bad argument and what's a good argument. And they like guys that had been wrestling and sparring, like in debates, they had experience of knowing what, how to win a, a debate legitimately, how to win a debate through manipulation. They knew when they were being duped, right? Romans had a far, Roman elite Romans, educated Romans had a far more sophisticated, it would put us to shame, like understanding of verbal rhetoric than we do today, right? Mm -hmm. And they would look at us and you know, the way we use social media and the news media, your CNN and your Fox and you know the social media gurus and stuff that you get today, and honestly, I really mean, like, Marcus would look at it, Seneca, like, the Stoics in general, and they would think, do you guys not understand how to think? Mm. Like, you don't, do you not understand what's a valid argument and an invalid argument? And when someone's making a sweeping overgeneralization, when someone's just attacking someone else's character as a way of undermining a statement that they made, you know, don't you know when you're being duped? Like, don't you spot when someone's changing the subject in order to defend themselves from a criticism of their argument like basic kind of debating skills or you know basic understanding of informal logic like they were trained in that and we're not no. and i the stoic said but you have to learn this stuff they thought at least a basic like they would consider this quite a basic level of education in order to protect yourself that's their the, the reason the stoics gave so that the predecessors of the stoics were the cynic philosophers and the cynics thought that um I'll tell, actually, I'll tell you a little aside in ancient greece there was a kind of dichotomy between two opposing views of what it means to be a philosopher and one of them was plato another was diogenes the cynic and so plato thought you need to study everything mathematics geometry like astronomy and it was very elite and it was very bookish and the cynics thought you don't need to study any of that garbage you just need to work on developing strength of character and self-discipline like and moral integrity and stuff like that and the Stoics are kind of somewhere in between. They said, yeah, like the academics are too academic. They're too bookish in their ivory towers. They disappeared up their own backside. They're arguing over how many angels can dance in the head of a pin kind of thing. <laughs> uh, but the Cynics are too much like Luddites, you know. And they said, look, you need to focus primarily on developing your character. But mm. in order to do that, you need to learn some things about logic and some things about physics and stuff, about human nature. And in particular, they said, their reason for studying logic is they said, look, you can work on your character, but if you don't know what a bad argument looks like or what verbal manipulation looks like, you're going to be a victim mm -hmm. for the rest of your life to people who try to manipulate you verbally. Sophists, rhetoricians, social media influencers today, like you're going to fall for their like tricks over and over again unless you have some basic education. Like and what the difference between a good and a bad argument is. So they were kind of somewhere in the middle of these two. They thought there's a middle way. They thought you have to do some studying, but only insofar as it contributes to improving your character. And if you're going off and studying stuff and it doesn't improve your character, then maybe that's actually a vice.
That's mm -hmm. why Marcus Aurelius, although he's the most bookish guy ever, he's a total nerd, right? Mm -hmm. Like, but he says in the meditations, you need to throw away your books because he's trying to find this balance between, you know, studying to improve his character, but not getting kind of like lost in the weeds of studying history and, you know, things that he doesn't necessarily need to know. It all has to come back to how does it help me to defend myself, improve my character and acquire emotional resilience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, and that's... That is in, in itself the most attractive portion of what Stoicism and the philosophy of Stoicism has meant to me, right? And, and I think to a lot of people that have picked it up over the past few years, because, dude, we've had a legendary 24 months, you know, like mm -hmm. in, in the annals of, of history. Like we've had this incredible time that you can actually go back if you study anything about Stoicism, you know about Marcus Aurelius, and there's a whole bunch of it uh, wrapped in here about the Antonine Plague. There's a couple of plagues that this fellow had to go through, right? And and one of the things that I thought was fascinating, and at the start of each one of these uh, chapters that you have in Verismus, uh, uh, Donald J. Robertson, it's it's a quote that is somehow from, uh, from the meditations, from Marcus Aurelius, that deals with something we struggle with today, right? And the thing that we struggle with today is the understanding that, sure, you know, we've been made sick by the pandemic, but the mental illness yes. that has destroyed some people, which is there's a great chapter in here about it, that is, about the Antonine Plague as it relates to today's pandemic. Um, the mental illness is, is, is a far bigger concern. It is a far bigger pandemic than what we've experienced. He says that it's the only time in the meditations that he even mentions the plague explicitly. And he's writing in the middle of a plague that lasted 15 years. And the only time he mentions it is to not say, a yeah, by the way, not a it complainer. sucks. He says it's bad, but you know what's even worse? It was the moral plague that's destroying people. And at the beginning of our pandemic, I would read that to people and I'd talk about it, write about it, go, this is what he says about pandemics. And they say, oh, that seems a bit kind of callous or dismissive. And now, oh, yeah. everybody left Watch or what right, whatever now is like, yeah, you're right. The pandemic kind of sucked, but all the other BS. Like that kind of resulted from it is is even worse. You had a point. Like it's true. Like well, and, and dude, if you said that to people at the start of the pandemic, where you're like, "Hey, listen, the pandemic's gonna be bad. Sure, a bunch of people are gonna die. Yeah, we're all gonna get long COVID, and we're gonna get sick and stuff, and we're gonna have to get back. But wait for the wait for the real pandemic after this pandemic of the mind that destroys people, relationships, families, senses of humor, people's livelihoods. Just wait for that. Wait for the 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 pretzeling that goes on in the inside people's heads. And he said this two thousand years ago, Donald, and it's like. It's and it is absolutely the most truest part of what we're experiencing out of the last two years yeah. right now, right? You mentioned the stuff on anger, and I always say that, like, I don't say this lightly. I used to teach psychotherapists, I trained them for many years, and so I would know, like, if I stood in front of a group of psychologists and counselors and life coaches and therapists, like, as I did every day, and I said, Hey, guys, can you how many cognitive strategies can you name for anger management? Like, let's play a fun game. Yeah. Like, and they they come up with two or three, right? I was always a bit disappointed they couldn't come up with more. But like, come on, man, like you know, like they come up with two, three, four. He has a list of ten. Mm. Like, and not only does he list them, he goes back to selections from it over and over. He knows these by heart, mm. and he's applying them over and over again. He knows more about anger management than any of the therapists that I've worked with over the years in that regard. It's it blows me away. I, I mean, I, I don't say it lightly, but he was, and stoicism in general, in some ways, was way ahead of its time. And you mentioned Freud. Freud, like, was a complete and utter ignoramus by comparison. Freud thought phobias were caused by repressed castration anxiety, right? <laughs> like, I mean, F Freud was completely delali. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. he, we use very little of what, what Freud said in, in evidence-based psychotherapy anymore. I mean... He retarded the development of modern scientific psychotherapy by over half a century. Well, he thought he was everything anti science. Yeah, dude, everything that I that I've read about Freud, because when you open up your belief system, you're like, all right, I'll read anything. And that was like three years ago. And I started reading about Freud. And then I heard you talking about it. And I remember thinking when I was reading Freud, I'm going, is this guy just doing dream analysis and then blaming his entire shitty yes. life on these terrible That's dreams? Exactly that he what had? He did. Like he Freud never did any research whatsoever no. in his entire career. In relation to psychotherapy right yeah. when he wrote his first book he'd only seen about six clients right <laughs> i could go on all day about freud he was a really weird guy like he ernest jones who is his one of his best friends and the head of the british psychoanalytic association he was a psychiatrist by profession 
wrote the first main biography of Freud, and he said Freud was the most neurotic man that he'd ever met. And he was a psychiatrist. <laughs> like, you know, like he was a Didn't, he, was didn't a Freud didn't guy. even believe in therapy, though, did he? Like, that was what I heard. Like, yeah. He didn't go to the therapy, end, he didn't do it. He had a lot of doubts about it, but Freud saw his clients for an average of about 3,000 sessions or something. He saw them five times a week for an average of five years. Like, and, you know, either you die of boredom or, you know, like, or, you know, or you give up. My, but he didn't have a good success rate. No. And he said weird, crazy things. But when I start, even like 20 or 30 years ago, people still were kind of clinging on to Freudianism a bit. Or maybe there was like some truth in it. And literary theorists and film theorists thought, oh, there's some validity in these ideas. We don't use any of this stuff in therapy anymore because it was bonkers. It's okay. We've reached a point in history now where it's now okay to laugh at Freud. Like and admit he's like a flat earther or something in terms of like <laughs> stuff. He probably has one. He he has said like one or two like that, but most of the stuff he says is just crazy. Yeah. It's the ignorant. It's like if you someone said they're a Michelin starred chef, right? And then they, but they didn't know how to boil an egg, right? You'd be like, there's something not right here, right? <laughs> Freud has no idea how to treat basic psychological problems no. like phobias and stuff. We have like a ninety percent success rate. Do you know the Freudians thought? the bedwetting in uresis was caused by repressed castration. They thought everything was caused by repressed castration anxiety. And so they, they, they thought if you train kids not to wet the bed, it'll just make them obsessively masturbate or they'll develop <laughs> something like they thought they'll have what they called symptoms. Oh, sorry, did that not happen? That wasn't, it wasn't. It didn't uh, happen. They just <laughs> taught kids. They used, they had a thing where if the blanket got wet, it sets yeah. a buzzer off and it would wake them up. And that has like a 90% success rate. So it's some of the very earliest clinical trials in psychotherapy were like, do you know what? They didn't all start obsessively masturbating. And do you know why not? Because you guys just made that up. You had no evidence. You just said, I reckon, like, it's because they're frightened of castration and they'll probably start masturbating or something, like, or they'll, they'll start obsessively gambling or they'll go crazy. It, it's completely made up, yeah. right? None of that happened. Oh, it turns out you can just teach people and train them to change their behavior, and that's absolutely fine. And it was when, that's when stoicism started to come back. It was with behavior therapy. Because the, the psychoanalysts were like, well, you can't go retraining your thoughts and develop, you know, because you, you have to get to the Oedipus complex and expose that. Otherwise, you know, because that's the real source of your problem. Now, it turns out the real source of your problem, according to Freud, was completely fictional, like a unicorn. Or it just doesn't exist. Right. And it's fine to train your habits and change your attitudes and stuff like that. It only does good things. Like basically, so he, yeah, we we've managed to escape from this cult. Basically, we've escaped from the chaise long, like after over half a century of nonsense, and that allows stoicism to come back into vogue. Thank goodness. Yeah, and it seems you know, I, I, and I say this to lots of people. I call it an antidote for the stuff that we experience today. For me, it's an antidote, you know, and it has been for for the past three years. It's getting to a point where you can challenge your belief system for a lot of people is going to be very difficult, right? Like if you've grown up in religion and we've, we, we've grown up and I heard you talking about it recently uh, where you just said, Hey, you know, I'm going to challenge myself. I'm going to show a little courage. I'm going to quit my job doing uh, uh, working for a tech company and I'm just going to study this stuff that I love. And uh, sure enough, you become a stoic wow. author, you become uh, a cognitive behavioral psychotherapist and, and, and with this passion to the point uh, of stoicism where you spend a lot of time. And by the way, there's a Toronto connection because you lived in Toronto and still split time between Toronto and Greece. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. But this is your, this is your passion. This is something, but it's also this, well, it's the only thing that has ever made sense to me in terms of yeah. an operating system. Do you know who you sound through. like Dean? Who is that? Socrates. Do I? Because he said the unexamined life is not worth living. No. He said it that isn't. at his trial. And that's exactly what he said. He said, what's the point unless you can question everything? Like, and, you know, that was at his trial. He said, I just want to do philosophy. I just want to be able to question stuff. I get a kick out of it. Like, it's how I express my freedom. Like, it's what he said. By the way, just to crowbar something into this discussion, Please. people sometimes ask me to recommend books, and I don't like doing it because I think, Different people, different people like different books, and there's so many books out there. But there's one exception that I'll make. I think everyone should read Plato's Apology because it's a it's a masterpiece of Western philosophy. It's the most important text in the Western philosophical canon. Why? Like it's a it's a literary masterpiece. 
Like, it's short. You can read it in an afternoon, a couple of hours. It's dramatic. It contains the seeds of all the Stoic philosophy. And you read it once, you know, at worst you'll have wasted a couple of hours. At most, there'll be ideas and images in it that leave a mark on you and remain with you for the rest of your life. Socrates is like, it's like a slow burner. He says these things that don't even make sense. But 20, 30, 40 years later, you'll still be kind of thinking about them. Mm. Yeah, I'm going to. I've never read it. I've never read the apology. I've, I've just, just got through. Uh, I just got through the moral letters. I will. I absolutely will. I just got through the moral letters, which is like you know when you start into the meditations. If you, it's not something you want to suggest to somebody who's like, tell me about stoicism. Like, I'm not going to give you the meditations first. I'm going to give you something else from someone who popularized the meditations, and uh, we'll go from there. But is that what you would suggest to people who? Because this is resonating with a lot of people in the comment section, and the more I talk to people about it, and and the more I see how incredibly popular. Um, you know, the, the idea of stoicism is and how many people it's helped kind of change their perspective and take control of the, their life. And actually kind of just through the process of knowing what you simply control and what you do not. Um, yeah. what would you suggest to people? Modernstoicism.com, which is your website, yeah, by the way. I'm one of the founders of modern stoicism. Like it's, it's run by a team of psychologists and academics. Yeah. Um, it was originally founded by, uh, Christopher Gill, who's professor emeritus of ancient thought at the University of Exeter in England. Mm -hmm. So it's a very authoritative resource, like leading authors and academics contribute. It has an annual conference, runs an annual online course. It's been going for over a decade now. So go there. That's a good place to start. In terms of books, read Ryan Holiday's, like The Daily Stoic is the most popular book. So that's a really good place to start. Mm -hmm. um, there are loads of books on stoicism. If you kind of, if you're cool with, not everyone's cool with classics, Dean, right? But if you're cool with the classics, if you're cool with the ye olde world, worldly stuff, right? Yeah then read uh, read the meditations but get a modern translation of it right like gregory hayes, gregory hayes or best, robin yeah. waterfield like if you read one of the 19th century translations like some people find that a little it's hard a tough going, go. like, unless yeah. they're into that right um but uh read the Enchiridion or the the handbook of epictetus it's really short you can read it mm -hmm. in like an hour but it's intense man it's the one that starts off saying some things are up to us and some things are not and he's kind of basically saying so deal with it you know, like, and that's where it starts. <laughs> like, and then the, the fifth sentence is it's not things that upset us, but rather our opinions yeah. ab about it. And then he says something even crazier, right? He said, because the Stoics will always go for your jugular. Epictetus, well, he's the one that used to be a slave. He'll go straight for your jugular. Yeah. Like, he says that. Do you know what he says next in the same paragraph? He says, because death, he says, death, yeah. therefore, is not inherently terrifying. Like, it just depends how your attitude towards it. He goes, because if it was, Socrates would have been terrified of dying, and he wasn't. Yeah. Like, so he uses Socrates in the apology, kind of, you know, standing up to the accusers in court and saying he's not scared of dying to prove, to say not everyone is actually scared of dying. Like, some people are willing to risk their lives to stand up for their principles. So death itself isn't inherently scary. It's just, your, like, it depends on the attitudes that you have towards it. Like, mm. it depends on your opinions about death. It depends on your values and so on. So he's he really pushes people's buttons. Like, if you're up for that, then read Epictetus. Um, and then read Plato's Apology. Not everyone, it's not going to be everyone's cup of tea, but I don't care. Like, if you don't like it, you've wasted, like, two hours, that's fine. You know, otherwise, you would have just been on Twitter or whatever anyway. <laughs> like, so, but if you like it, it might shape your world. Yeah. Like, and you might think that guy said some weird stuff. It's kind well, of the incredible, the incredible is like, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it, it's like, it means guide or knife or uh, something like it, it's like the, the yeah. incredible. Yeah. Like it's dagger. like, yeah, it, it is what it means. It's like, this is what you're going to take to kind of slice and dice your way through the shitty parts of life. If you just kind of pay attention. But the incredible was the first time that I was like, maybe I should look into how the Stoics viewed death because he, he absolutely delivers the goods in, in the incredible. And it's like, I, I have been obsessed with trying to not die over the, like the last 49 years of my life. And only in the past couple of years, I've gotten to the thing. It's like, you got to get comfortable with this idea, man, because yeah. it is going to happen. And I'll tell you something, the more I learn about it, the less scary it is. And the more you're able to live your life fully, like, and that's like out of fear. And it's amazing how important getting close to death oh. and understanding death is in, uh, in, in a, in a, in a life well lived, but specifically in stoic philosophy. Do you know who you sound like? Uh, Epictetus. Seneca. 
Seneca. Sorry, Seneca now. It's not my Seneca, favorite story. Seneca said, I know, it's not the coolest story. But he did say some cool things. He said yeah, to learn how to die is to unlearn how to be a slave. Mm. And what he means is that coming to terms with your own mortality mm. is the key to freeing yourself from a lot of other uh, fears in life. We have to overcome our fear of death because it's going to happen whether we like it or not. Yeah. Like it's inescapable. It's the story. It's a human given. It's a fact of life. You've got to come to terms with it and stop burying your head in the sand. You can't really live fully. Like until he also says at one point, no man that's frightened of dying has ever done anything worth uh, living for. Mm -hmm. There's another crazy thing that's in it, like hardcore thing that Seneca says. Mm -hmm. So the stories are good at saying these kind of extreme things. Um, for sure, you have to overcome your fear of death. Like it gets easier as you get older and everyone else starts dying. Like or you have brushes with death. Like most people, but I think by the time they've reached middle age, not everyone, but I think the majority of people by the time they're middle age have had at least one or two brushes with death, either because they were maybe in an accident or, you know, maybe they had some health problems or whatever, and they thought, maybe this is it, buddy. Yeah. You know, maybe my time's up. I've had <laughs> four or five, like, you know, when I was a kid, like, I nearly And it only scares you times. after, right? Like, you're almost drowned yeah. a couple of times, but you're only scared after you almost die. It's, you're never scared while you're almost dying. You're only scared after and you, you think do. about it. And you do. You think, I guess I should buck up my ideas now. <laughs> like, you think, you think, that was nearly it, right? And then you yeah, think, yeah. and they think, oh, do you know what I haven't done? I haven't watched all the episodes of Friends. Or, like, you know, like, you don't think, you think, no, I screw that. Like, no one on their tombstone has ever had engraved, I wish I'd spent more time on YouTube. Yeah. Or, you know, I wish I'd spent more time watching Friends or something like that. So it makes it snaps you out the track, boom, the Stoics thought the fear, like coming to terms with your own mortality is one of the few things that can snap us out of the, the, the fog, like snap us out of the trance that we're all in, we're like sleepwalking around, like, and, and think this isn't what life is meant to be about. It's not meant to be just like earning money so that you can buy candy and, go to the cinema and watch Thor Love and Thunder and then come out of it and think it was rubbish. Like, it's, it's a waste of time. Like, it's, they've, they've sold you a lemon. Like, that's, all of this stuff is pointless. Like, and when you have a brush with death, sometimes it gives you that shade where you think, maybe I need to be doing something else. Maybe I need to decide like, what I think is actually worth doing and not. Like, you know, maybe I need to kind of try and understand the world or maybe I need to try and create something original. Like, those are the things that really count for something. Like, when you're lying on your deathbed or whatever and you look back, you you know, kind of think, oh, I'm glad I spent all those hours in the office, you know, put, pushing paper clips around or whatever it was I do. Like, yeah. you kind of think, oh, I'm glad I wrote that book or, you know, I'm glad that, that time that I kind of did some things that helped people or whatever. See, so, you know, coming to terms with your own mortality, the Stoics thought, memento mori, like, remember that you must die is this kind of key practice. Like they, we should do, the Stoics thought we should do it every day. Seneca said that every night when he went to bed, before yeah. he closed his eyes, he was like closing his eyes. He was like, I might not wake up tomorrow. He would say to himself in order to just kind of, and every morning he'd wake up, like he would say to himself, I might not make it to the end of the day. <laughs> like, and I mean, I can imagine that if you lived uh, in Rome and you were part of Nero's court. Well, and the but, Antonine Plague and all the other stuff, the, the Athens yeah, Plague. Yeah, I Definitely. mean, you know, but th that's how, th death was very different for for ancient Romans and ancient that's Greeks, right? Life. It's like, ha it, yeah, it's like very fact of life. And so there, I find there's a disconnect for a lot of people because you know yeah. mortality rates are so much better than they are. You're expected to live for a long period of time. Back then, like Marcus really has had like eight, seven or eight kids who passed away, but and they, they yeah, yeah. I mean, it was just like that's how they needed to steal themselves to be able to get through the day. But I go back to the same thing, and and it, through stoicism and through some of these values, I've learned that. Man, this is this is part of life. This is you know a more fate, right? Uh, this is this is we, this is these are the fates. This is you're born a one in quad four hundred quadrillion chance of actually making it onto this planet as a life, and that is the importance of this life. But it also expresses the importance of death and understanding it because it is gonna happen no matter what. It's absolutely you know like the key I think, or uh, and the Stoics put a lot of emphasis on it coming to terms with our own mortality. They, um, even that saying outside the Temple of Apollo, it says, Gano thy seoton, or know thyself. It's the most famous slogan of ancient philosophy. It's carved on a pillar outside the Temple to Apollo at Delphi. Like, it became a slogan of ancient philosophy. Seneca says it means know that you're uh, going to die. Like, know that you're mortal. It's a memento mori. 
He says to know yourself is to know that you're not an immortal, mm -hmm. like to know that you're fragile, like transient. Marcus Aurelius goes further. He says, this isn't the same body that your mother gave birth to, which is a weird thing to say, yeah. but it's true. Like, he said, he's, you've died. He says to himself, I've died already loads of times. He goes, the Marcus Aurelius that was a kid is dead. Like that was decades ago. Like Marcus Aurelius, the teenager, like the young Caesar, like that's dead. Like he's gone. Like you're, Seneca said, you're dying every day. Like, but we don't do anything. Like more importantly, at a deeper level, we die every day because we walk around in a trance and we're all talking no action. Mm. Like we waste our lives frittering at wages, killing time. Like modern society is all about coming up with ways to anesthetize our ourselves and kill time. Like we do drugs and alcohol. Like we have casual sex. Like we kind of wander around looking at tourist attractions. Like we stare at the TV. And stuff like we've got all on of... Facebook, Twitter, just the surface yeah, stuff. The yeah, sophists on CNN and Fox. Yeah. Yeah. Like try telling us stuff that we actually all know is garbage. But like. I love it. I didn't realize how bad American news was and stuff like And then I started scrolling through and I was like, Don Lemon is aghast at this. And I thought, like, the it's all like kind of clickbait stuff. Even the headlines are like, you know, this is all editorializing, kind of like, oh shock, Tucker Carlson shocked, like horror that like I don't need them to be shocked on my behalf. <laughs> like I thought I'll decide, like, it's not shocking. Like, none of it surprises me. Thanks very much. Like, you know. You need to be told, yeah. yeah they're a bunch yeah. of drama queens. Like, <laughs> they, and I don't need them rent in space, living rent-free in my head. Thanks no. very much. I'd no. Be you'd be crazy to invite these people into your head. Well, but we do, right? We do because it's like uh, we're attracted and we've got this like weird animal mind where, you know, like someone tells us we're supposed to be aghast or shocked or in something is insane. On yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, it's like uh, the world's on fire, apparently. <laughs> like, you know, but I hadn't noticed because I'm too busy, you know, just writing books and things like that. Like, so, you know, sometimes you're busy and you think, oh, I must have missed all this stuff. Yeah. Like, it's funny when you look back on it as well. I, I have a belief, Dean. That once you reach middle age, there's two types of people in this world. Oscar Wilde said there's two types of people in this world. The type of people that divide everybody into types of two types of people and the type of people that don't. But I think sometimes it's useful to do a division. I think some people when they reach middle age, like stop and look back and think, what have I learned? Mm. And then there's other people that just don't do that. Like, And one of the ways to gain some degree of wisdom is just looking back and thinking, do you remember all that? Do you remember the Millennium Bug? Do you remember all the other stuff that we lived through and all like you know, like all the do you remember the Cold War? Like, and when you look back on it with the benefit of hindsight, a lot of the catastrophes seem like, yeah, I mean, I guess we could have all blown up, but it didn't happen though. <laughs> like, and do you remember all the time that people spent going on about it on TV? Yeah. Like, it's, it reminds me of something, right? In therapy, we we still haven't cracked the nut of worry. Like worrying is one of the main components of psychopathology. And we know a lot about it. There's tons of really cool research on worry, but we still haven't completely broken the back of it. But we do know some good things about it. But one of the things we know is that if you get people to keep a diary of the stuff that they worry about, and then you're like, how much of it actually happened? Like the vast majority of things, of course, that people worry about never happen. Right, so mm -hmm. either they never happen, or they do happen, but they're not as bad as they thought they were going to be. Or they do happen, but they're more able to deal with it, cope and get through it than they thought they would be. So worry consists of catastrophizing, which is overestimating the severity and probability of a threat and underestimating your coping ability. Something mm -hmm. awful is going to be going to happen, and I don't know what to do about it, is what people say when they're worrying over and over and over again. But when you look at the amount of time that people... So if I say to clients, how much time did you spend yesterday worrying? They'll say, oh, all day. Fuck the whole like, day, dude. I, was, I was up all night. I couldn't get to sleep. I was worrying about stuff. Only but 20 hours. That's it. I only worried for 20 straight hours. How did yeah. we spend wor time worrying about being nuked by Russia or the Millennium Bug causing satellites to drop out of the sky or killer bees or whatever? As a society, we should start. We need to redo. We need to restart and have a, a kind of um, get economists on this. We need an economy of worry. Like I, mean, I think we're spend, we're investing too much time in worry. How do you like, monetize worry in 2022? That's yeah, like Jeff Bezos' you should, next you thing. You should monetize right? it. Yeah. Like, we should say to people, you have to pay. If you want, like, you know, a swear box or whatever. We should yeah. say, if you're going to sit worry and worry job. about dumb stuff, 
like you have to pay like a dollar for every yeah. like 10 minutes that you spend right. doing it and then they'd stop yeah like but it's a weird thing i'll tell you here's a little bit here's a deep dive a little bit of insider thing one little last bit of wisdom because uh, this is one of my my area of expertise was treating anxiety disorders believe it mm -hmm. or not and what the research shows us is um basically the key one of the keys is that um we have a very simplistic idea of emotion as society we have what psychologists sometimes call a lump theory of emotion so people go i have anxiety it's just like a feeling but actually anxiety consists of different components it's like a cake which is made from many ingredients so there's voluntary aspects of anxiety there's involuntary aspects there's cognitive behavioral affective parts of it like it's a complex thing but when we realize it's complicated like a a, a watch mechanism we can break it like worry is fragile and we want to break it because it's like an evil story we tell ourselves it's like we tell ourselves a horror story about the future when we worry it's, it's a like, life stealer worries it's a life evil stealer. self hypnosis yeah. buddy it's yeah. like evil self hypnosis that we do in ourselves it's like it wastes a lot of time right but one of the things that people don't realize is that we have parts of worrying the the cognitive process of worrying is actually voluntary right it's called what we call strategic cognition it's under voluntary control and the clue is that it involves worrying involves like a string of sentences like it's like a story a narrative that you tell yourself if it takes place over time you can interrupt it mm -hmm. right that means you can break it. it's under voluntary control so the reason i'm emphasizing that is in clinical practice and in research we know that people who have pathological worrying the people that are diagnosed as having what we call generalized anxiety disorder or gad mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. Those people tend, if you say to them from zero to 100%, how strongly do you agree with the statement, worry is uncontrollable? They'll say 100%, like my worry is uncontrollable. And you go, that's weird, because worry is actually a voluntary cognitive process, like from everything that we know about it. So people massively underestimate how much voluntary control they have over the activity of worrying. And usually in therapy, we have to do a bunch of things to help them realize that they can take control of a worry, my and the strategies that they could maybe use to control it but the core of it is that they assume that it's an under control uh, that it's uncontrollable they go my worries out of control but you're doing it to yourself it's actually a, some parts of emotion are involuntary right like panic attacks are involuntary but worrying as a process is something you could just you might it's like you're punching yourself in the face repeatedly you could right. stop doing it right but people don't believe they can stop doing it and they don't quite understand how they would stop doing it. They usually do a little bit of coaching or training. But that's well, how messed up we are. We don't know. We we are very confused about Well, we don't our... do the work, right? Like that's the other thing, Donald. It's like like it's it's it, we we know we can get better, but to your point earlier where you talked about and in putting in that, that investment of time into the things that you can understand and how to get better, and you say, Hey, listen, how much time did you spend reflecting? How much time did you spend doing this? And they're like, Zero, none. Nothing, nada. None. It's true. Like, you know, these are the things that really kind of hit home um, with people, just kind of the realization that they, that there are huge gaps, mm. like, and, and they're not really, I, I come back to, we mentioned anger earlier, like the internet's awash with self-help advice, like I said earlier, but hardly any of it addresses anger. Mm. And really like, that's the key to self-improvement in my mind. Like everybody has anger to some extent like hatred, spite, bitterness, resentment, desire for revenge, whatever you want to call it. Like, and it's the area where I think we can potentially do the most to, to really benefit ourselves and transform our character. But it, one way that people get confused is sometimes people say, how can you sit there and say that self-help is a bad thing? You know, this self-help advice is useful, blah, 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 right? Well, it's like as if you are a guy standing in your garden, Dean, and your shed is on fire. And you're trying to put it out. And I'm like, buddy, you shouldn't be doing that. And you're like, how can you stand there, Donald, and tell me that I shouldn't be trying to put out the fire in my shed? And I'd be like, because look behind you, your whole house is in fire. Like, you should put that out. Like, and that's what self-help is like. Yeah. They're like, oh, I found this technique that kind of helps a bit. But a lot of the times, the self-help that people are doing is just distracting them, taking time away. Like, it's kind of tokenism in a sense that they're not really doing the stuff that they need to you we all know people that are self-help junkies that mm -hmm. we look at and think dude you're the most neurotic guy i've ever met and you've yeah, got like a library of self -help yeah yeah you're doing yeah. everything except the thing that you need to do to actually help yourself mm -hmm. it's a self-help can become a form of avoidance because it's all targeting the wrong aspects of the problem in many cases because we have blind spots
my and that's why therapists sometimes can be useful because the therapist can say uh it kind of looks to me like you're focusing in the wrong areas and then they can redirect their attention or your parents might do that for you or your friends might do it for you but in today's society where people are all loners and they're on their internet and they're like the self-help often is just misdirected like they're digging holes all over the place but not in the one place that they actually need to be doing it for the tre- mm. they're missing where the treasure's buried yeah. Well, and, and, and th- that's such a great, you know, place to kind of jump off and, and let you have a, the rest of your day to yourself because I've taken a, 90 minutes of your time. Um, but it, it's it's so true. I mean, you know, the people that I talk to about this, that'll say something to me like, you know, what are you doing different or what are you reading or what are you learning? Um, it's all and I go back to this again off. Tim Ferriss saying it's an operating system. It's mm-hmm. it's 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 like what am I doing for me so I can understand me at the very base level and life around me in the most objective way possible so that I don't put a value judgment on something that makes me angrier than I need to be, right? Whereas there are a lot of people that'll say, "Listen, I've got an anger problem, so you know, what drugs do I need or what life hack can I get? It's not like, how do I dig in and unearth the soil of the belief system of this craziness that has brought me to this point where everything triggers me today? I was going to say something else controversial. I shocked me when I came to Canada, especially Toronto. You guys seem to hand out psychoactive drugs like tranquilizers, like candy. Oh, yeah. Like in Britain, this isn't how it works. Like... Those benzos, like even Jordan Peterson became addicted to benzos. That's shocking to psychotherapists and clinical psychologists. Because he's we all not know really a clinical psychologist, is he's he? He's a professor Peterson? of clinical psychology. But, but, he, you, but when you look at him, what do you think, as, as someone who deals in what you deal with, not just the philosophy and how you help people, CBT, when you see what he's become uh-huh. and you see the avoidance that he's gone through in his life and you see his belief system being so charged up and matched up to that evangelical Christian perspective. How do you like, as what what do you think of Jordan Peterson? I read his book, 12 rules cover to cover twice. I'll get paid to review it. Um, And I said this at a talk I gave in Toronto and people went crazy. I, cause somebody asked me what was the worst book I'd ever read. (laughs) Or something like that. I can't remember. It was like, what's the worst self help? And I was like, Jordan Peterson one, obviously. Like, and they were like, that's how real, how can you say that? And I was like, oh, because it, it is, it's dreadful. Like, it's the biggest pile of pseudoscientific hogwash that I've ever read in my life. Um, it's like, if, if, it, if it was covered up and I didn't know who it was by, not in a million years would I ever have dreamt that it was written by a psychologist, let alone Why? a professor. Because it's mainly he goes on about the Adam and Eve and the like garden of eden and there's a lot of kind of new age cod union biblical exegesis in it mm. which i'm sure that his fans are not into like because i was like reading it and i was like and there's like five pages and this is still going like did you laugh about, I, I thought it was bonkers <laughs> like i laughed at the preface where the some weird psychoanalytic dude wrote a preface going on about how um like Jordan Peterson's like a genius and like, all this kind of stuff and I just it's ridiculous like, like I I've never see people he traded on this idea that he was somehow some sort of credible scientific I'd never heard of him like I'd never and people say oh you're just saying that I was like okay let me get every book that I've got in my library on psych <laughs> he's not mentioned in any of them like his name doesn't occur in any of the clinical textbooks that I've got, I'd never come across the guy before. Yeah, and and I was like, I I, I say this on all honesty, not to despise. It's just a, a fact. Like mm-hmm. if I didn't see the cover of that book and I read it, I would assume, apart from maybe one or two references, I would have assumed it was written in 1970, roughly, right? Like which is a long ass time ago now. Yeah, like, just I like really... how colonial and misogynistic the whole thing was, or was it the fact that one of the rules to having a great that. life is cleaning up your room and the other Honestly, one was, was about all, petting it was, cats? It was, it was this, all the kind of cod Jungian stuff, and it's super yeah. weird that he never really mentions Jung, because it's all Jungian stuff. Yeah. Like, and then the kind of weird pseudoscience stuff that you wouldn't get away with normally now in talking to psychologists, and the, the complete absence of any reference whatsoever to not only to CBT, but to any evidence-based form of modern psychotherapy, I'd be like, when was this written? Like, and there's no way this was written by a clinical psychologist. There's no clinical psychology in it. Like, he says stuff about lobsters and stuff like that, which is like, and then his fans are like, oh, that's like science. It's not. 
Like, it's pseudoscience. It's, it's masquerading as science, but it's absurd. Like, a first-year undergraduate student would be torn or, like, a, a strip off them for writing something like that. It's absurd. What's he his says, reputation in, in, psych, in, in psychology circles? Like, obviously, you're like one of he, the heavy he hitters. Like, he's a buffoon. Like, mm -hmm. he's, yeah, I've never met a single clinical psychologist or psychotherapist that would, like, uses or recommends it. Not one, ever. Like, um, he, if he believes that walking with your back up, right, let me tell you a little, like, so the beginning of that book. So he's got all this kind of advice in it that he makes it seem like it's evidence-based, but there are no clinical trials supporting any of it, right? And he's never presented any of it at, at, at kind of psychotherapy conferences, as far as I'm aware, because the audience would just be like, where's the evidence for that? Like, and they'd tear it apart. But he never exposes himself to that kind of peer review or critique because like, people would just tear it apart. It's, the stuff he says is nonsensical and completely flies in the face of everything that we do know about psychotherapy. It's, I can't... It's hard, you know, when it's hard to critique something because it's so ridiculous. Yeah. Like, you just want to go, this is just a, like a dumpster fire. Well, dude, like, like, while we're sitting here talking about how much of a dumpster fire he is, which, by the way, is the best part. Like, I've loved so, every second of this, but like the fact that you get into this, because someone said to me the other day, hey, are you supposed to be making fun of Jordan Peterson? Because I had stoicism in my bio. I'm like, pretty sure Marcus would be cool with it. Um, but anyway, the, yeah, but, everything he says is the opposite of stoicism. This yeah, yeah. Think it's I said the other day we Hate should tattoo him. him. I'd like to hope we should hold him down and tattoo on his forehead. Like <laughs> it's not things that upset us, but our opinions about them. And then all of his fans would be reminded of that simple psychological fact. Whenever he's going on about how it's natural for young men to be violently enraged. If, so, if they ask someone out on a date and they turn them down, like that that's normal and it's kind of got to do with societies rather than that's not normal like you know that's a product of your attitudes and opinions and stuff like that because we know emotions are cognitively mediated it's got nothing to do with chaos and order and this like weird theory that you have about like it's got to do with your beliefs like and your values and stuff like we with a ton of research and anger like none of this kind of squares with it but yeah, like, I'll tell you another thing. The first thing I noticed is this stuff about he says you've got to walk up straight, right? And I don't know where we'll where even begin with this. Like, I mean, I would think it's common sense, having worked with 15-year-olds in rough schools, right, that got bullied and beaten up or were bullied. Like, if you say to a kid, what you should do is look people in the eye. This is his advice. This is the advice of someone who's never been in a fight, Right. What you should do is stand up straight and look them dead in the eye, and then they'll think you're like some sort of alpha lobster. No, they're going to kick your head in, right? <laughs> it's that's crazy. Like they're not going to think you're an alpha lobster or whatever. They, you stand up straight and look people in the eye. You prove that'll be a provocation, and they'll beat the crap out of you. Sure, well, that's terrible advice. But also more fundamentally. He says this is a, a treatment. He says this is a strategy that works for social anxiety. So that's my specialist area, right? I mainly specialize in treating social anxiety disorder. And what he says is absurd, like because we know that um, we have a seventy-five percent success rate, by the way, in treating uh, social anxiety disorders across. Uh, with CBT, with proper CBT, CBT not proper Jordan proper Peterson proper certified is. CBT. It bears no resemblance to what he says. Yeah, right. No. So we already largely, we were almost there. Like yeah. we've got, and the success rate actually now we believe is a bit higher. Like so, we're pretty much cracking it. How do we do that? Right. We do it in part. Now we know that a focus of attention is key to social anxiety. So we, of course, people with social anxiety say that they feel like the spotlight's on them. They feel very self-conscious. There's a, a, a an above 0 0.99 correlation between measures of social anxiety and measures of self-focused attention. That's gold dust, right? They're virtually the same thing, right? So we know self uh, social anxious people have highly heightened self-consciousness. Now we know from clinical trials using attentional retraining that when people are socially anxious, they tend to put too much attention on their body. So they'll think about their breathing. They'll be thinking about whether they're blushing and what their face looks like. They'll be imagining what they look like to the audience. They'll be listening to the sounds of their own voice. Whereas in a normal conversation, you're just looking at the person you're talking to mm -hmm. and maybe kind of looking around the room casually or whatever. You're kind of thinking about the topic, but you're not usually focusing that much attention on your own 
uh, actions and appearance, right? That's in the unnatural. conversation, yeah. Right. So what you tend to find is that self-focused attention has to be maintained by something. So it's usually maintained by maladaptive coping strategies or what we call safety-seeking strategies in, in uh, psychotherapy. So clients will do things like they'll try and breathe more slowly to calm themselves down because they think, I did a yoga course, and they taught me to control my breathing. That's fantastic, buddy. But now you're thinking about your breathing, and that's going to make you even more self-conscious than you were to begin with. So that happens. people do crazy stuff like that all the time, right? They'll mentally rehearse what they're about to say before they say it out loud, right? That's going to make you even more focused like on your own behavior. And so Peterson's advice that if you're socially anxious, you should stand up straight and look people in the eye more is like focus like that's the sort of thing that clients say when they come into therapy like that's exactly the sort of maladaptive coping strategy like that they pick up from bad self-help books mm -hmm. like and usually in cognitive therapy the first thing you have to do is to say yeah maybe you, you want to try not doing that anymore like let, let's we do what's called abandoning safety seeking behaviors uh, as the in the initial assessment and therapy so we'll try and identify things that clients are doing and often they're kind of like quasi quack self-help techniques and we used to, we have to get them to stop doing that stuff like and then just train them to act more naturally like so we train them to focus more on the audience we'll say look at the audience and and, and try and figure out how many people in the audience have got blue eyes like or try and broaden your attention to pay uh, attention to as many different people as you can at once and so we'll play them audio recordings that get them to retrain their attention and we know that works and it's the port that and it's the opposite of Jordan Peterson's advice. I it, I would have thought that this is a dude that's never worked with bullied kids or people who are socially anxious. But at the very least, even if he's got this amazing radical insight, like I think where's the evidence that this is based on? Or where's the kind of clinical material or like anything? Like, or come and present that at a conference. And then all the psychologists in the room will be like, how is this a good idea? Like, surely that's just uh, a safety-seeking behavior. Like, you're going to make them even more self-focused if they do that, and it's going to make their social anxiety worse, is it not? Like, and then he'd have to answer that criticism. But he doesn't, what he's done now is he's not even on Twitter anymore. So it's kind of like this extreme narcissism where he just pumps out this pseudoscientific hogwash. And he's now, like, pulled up his skirts and flounced off so that, even if people disagree with him and call him out on his BS, yeah. he doesn't even want to listen to it anymore. So he's created this weird narcissistic bubble that he exists in where he just says stuff that's kind of completely contrary to what we do in modern psychotherapy and would seem to all intents and purposes as like really bad self-help well, advice. Right? It's contrary to being a good human being. Like, you know, what he said about Elliot Page last week. I've got the video. I don't want to waste your time with it. But what he said about Elliot Page yeah. uh, going off. About, and, and it's like it, it's using hatred as a motivator, which is the dumbest shit I've ever seen well, in my life. Course. It's like it's antithetical to everything in stoicism, in cognitive behavioral therapy. It's antithetical to living a good life. It's antithetical to having good character. And I go back to this all the time, and Ryan said it the other day again, I thought it was brilliant, which bad for the hive is bad for the bee. I mean, he's kicking the hive, he's kicking the hive, he's kicking the hive. He's but really what he's doing is he's forcing himself into himself again, which is why he was, you know, addicted to benzos, and he had to spend like three months in some Russian meat sweat. I spoke to a psychiatrist the other yeah. week, and he was like the same as me. Like, you know, everyone I know that works in mental health is, how do you get addicted to benzos? Like, and he said, I don't know if this is true, but someone told me his his reasoning was he said that he didn't know that they were addictive or something. I hope that's not true. Like, he must have known they were addicted. Like, he, that's insane. Like, but it's really weird, like, because any therapist or clinician would know that benzos are highly addictive, that they're, they're not really good as a treatment for anxiety. We usually, in Britain, you're only meant to get a few of them at a time, like, because they don't really help with anxiety. They just mask the symptoms temporarily. They don't help depression. Like, they're uh, tranquilizers. They're an anti-anxiety drug mainly. I mean, if you've got depression, you might have anxiety as well. And then it can help a bit. But there, there are drugs we generally, you know, discourage people from taking except in extreme circumstances. And he must have known that. Um, so it's quite, it's very odd. I mean, but everything he says is is just very, very strange, it seems to me. 
Um, and he's an expert, so he's not even an. He says nothing about evidence-based psychotherapy somehow in his books. He's not an expert on psychotherapy, but now he's an expert on climate change and the war in Ukraine and you know everything. Apparently, yeah, crypto, like, crypto he's way crypto. outside his sphere of of expertise. I think the other things that are puzzle me about this dude are like he said there's no such thing as Islamophobia, um, and then he kind of flirted with the alt-right he got funding from like the alt-right and he said he got a photograph of himself next to a guy posing who has a t-shirt and saying there's no such thing as islamophobia right the problem with doing stuff like if you're going to put yourself out in public and kind of wrestle with contentious political issues that maybe that's me he's entitled to say stuff like that but what happens if his next client is a muslim kid that's been bullied at school or something like that like, you have to be careful what you say because then in the consulting room, it kind of comes back and bites you. Like, it, it, any therapist would say, that's it. This some, some of this seems like strange stuff to say. Like, and suppose also the stuff about gender, like, if he has a client, like, who's experiencing gender dysphoria, like, are they going to see all the stuff that he's been saying on YouTube and how is that going to affect the relationship? Like, he doesn't see clients anymore from what I understand, but he can because he's saying all of these things that would destroy the therapeutic relationship. But he's been doing that for a long time. He was sanctioned by his professional body at one point, and, which I take very seriously. I used to sit on ethics committees. Right? So they obviously thought that he'd done something pretty seriously wrong in order to publish the, the fact that he'd been sanctioned. Mm. Um, but yeah, like I, um, I don't consider this... There are, lo I, there are a lot of self-help books out there that I think are fantastic, but that's not, that is not one of them. Um, <laughs> well said. I mean, we've been saying that for it some time. It, it comes out in who he is, right? You know, you can see the consternation in him. You can the see the problems. Of stoicism. Yeah, it is. Like, Everything he says. It's is... a victim. What he's teaching is like weirdly a victim mentality. Totally. Like, it's all society's fault. They did this like, to you. But that's, yeah, you know what? And now I'll tell you what the protectionism behind stoicism during the pandemic that taught me one thing. And I said this to all our guys all the time, too. Donald J. Robinson joins us. Uh, I said this to him all the time. There's a group of people out there that think everything is happening to them. And there's a group of people out there that just thinks that things are happening and they crack on with it. You know, they get on with the business of life. That's the guy I wanted to be, the latter guy. But when I look at what Jordan Peterson does and the January 6th people and the convoy people and the, the protest people and the people that continually rail on other people for the, the way their life is. That's all I see is the two group instead of the, hey, this shit's just going on and we just got to deal with it because that is fate. It's a more fate, right? Like this is we make the best of what we do. It, the world's gone like a bit not like there are people in America that believe that Canada's like a dictatorship or something yeah. Yeah. because they watch. So I meet Americans all the time and they're like, well, that Trudeau guy, he's like a fascist dictator or whatever. I'm like, uh, well, I mean, like, I don't necessarily agree with all these politics, but oh, it's terrible in Canada. You don't have any freedoms and stuff. I'm like, it's pretty similar to America, to be honest. It's not like, it's not like we're living in Stalinist Russia or something like that. But they yeah. think it is like that mm -hmm. because that's what they've got from something that they've been watching on YouTube. Like, I don't know if it's Tucker Carlson or if it's like Joe Rogan or like whoever it is that they've watched, but somewhere from like the media or social media, they've got this like completely, it reminds me of, there was a time when somebody on Fox News said that large parts of London were under Sharia law. I don't know if you remember that. Mm -hmm. Like, and the host on Fox was like agreeing with them. And there's one of the few times that Fox had to publish, like they had to, to have a retraction on air because people in Britain were just rolling about laughing. They were like, so you guys, you have this mental, you think Britain is basically like this Muslim state now and it's under Sharia a lot. Like, that's not true. Mm -hmm. Like, it bears no resemblance to reality. But people that live in a country and consume this media and never travel and go to other countries. But I had no idea that that would happen with Canada. Mm -hmm. Canada is like a hop, skip and a jump across the border. You can see it out the window. Mm -hmm. Like, you can like, I was in Detroit before, it's just across the river. Like, but there's people in the States that could throw a stone and hit Canada and think that it's like Stalinist Russia or something because they've got this idea of the internet somewhere. Mm -hmm. It's really weird. Like, but that's how distorted reality has become. 
Yeah. Objective, subjective, right? I mean, it's it's what people see and what they see and what they hear. And we live in that age. I mean, we've always lived in that age. We've lived in a time when, you know, influence is more important than accountability. And so people will do what they have to do. And it shapes minds and it poisons minds. And there are influencers and people out there that lead that charge as well. But um, listen, I want to thank you for being on the show, Donald. Um, and, and really, I, I mean, thank you for the work that you've done. Uh, thank God, by the way, history has come to your doorstep because it's a, it's a pretty incredible story is, is how, you know, and, 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 and I would encourage everybody to pick up anything that Donald's written, including this book. It's called Verissimus, uh, and it's the Stoic philosophy of Marcus Aurelius. Really cool because it's not just like, um, you know, obviously an illustrated graphic novel in terms of Marcus Aurelius's life and the values of Stoicism, but it's also got some really great explainers in the, in the back end and in, on the, in the front end, in the, in the preface as well, like in the appendix. It's, it's a great little explainer at the end of it. It's a few pages where you can kind of go, what did that mean? How do I apply that to my life? Because this is about works. It's about turning the philosophy of these people that used it to manage their lives into works to manage our own lives today so that we can get on with the business of doing and being and experiencing what we have left on this planet because it's coming for all of us going back to the original thing. But go and pick up this book. It's available tomorrow, I think, pretty much anywhere. It comes out tomorrow. Is that correct, Donald? Yeah, you can order it from any bookshop, like anywhere online. I think what yeah. we're basically saying here, Dean, is the ancient Greek philosophy? It's the future, huh? Two thousand uh, years like ago, it. it's the future. <laughs> we are saying it. And Donald, listen, thank you for your work. Thank you for your help. Thank you for making so much time for me today. This has been. Uh, I I haven't had a chance to catch up with anybody on Stoicism, uh, specifically someone like yourself that's considered uh, seminal in this in the in the practice and putting it into practice in CBT. And so. Uh, I want to thank you. Follow Donald at Don J. Robertson. In the description is everything, including modernstoicism.com, including your website, all the resources. If you're interested, you want to get started, you want to live uh, a, a mentally bulletproof existence where you can learn from these things, you can embrace fate, you can embrace the bad things and learn from them so that you can go through the bad things for the rest of your life and be a happy, productive person that takes control of your own happiness, I would highly encourage you to visit everything that this man does. Thanks, Donald. Really appreciate you being here. Likewise. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much. Take care. Donald J. Robertson, ladies and gentlemen, he is a stoic author, and he's also a cognitive behavioral therapist, psychotherapist, as a matter of fact. And that was a trip for me. Holy moly. Dude. Was that Dude, heavy, that was, boys? That was No, that was great. Was that like, awesome? That was, that was awesome. actually was really fun to listen to. Yeah, his yeah. voice I could listen to for hours. Though. He's from like, dude, Toronto connection there too. Ryan Lindley joins us from the Sheeple Shepherd podcast, Sheep King JB from uh, at Sheep King JB, wherever you get Sheep King JB, including TikTok, Twitter, etc. Um, yeah, that dude, that was like, so that was that was weird for me because I I'm never nervous to do these things. Like I'm never nervous to do these podcasts. I'm never nervous to go on. But when you are like that, dude is a giant in the industry of cognitive behavioral therapy worldwide he's a giant in the popularization and the use of stoicism in your life writing stoicism he's a giant in history he's a yeah. he is he is one of the best human beings that i know that has the ability to be able to take all that ancient wisdom and boil it down into something that is so easily understandable that acts as an operating system for your life and i can't stress enough like dude i stopped drinking five years ago in august Two years after a sub drink, and I'm like, this is fucked. I got to have something else. Like, I, And I hate religion. I didn't want to. I just needed to figure something out. And my buddy Hank sent me this incredible uh, book because I was talking to him on the phone. Like, I, I want to be able to have the world fall like apart around me and for me to be normal, just for yeah. me to be able to manage it like a human being. And he's like, oh, send you a book. So he sent me a book. And it was Ryan Holiday's book. It was called Ego is the Enemy. I was pissed. I'm like, I don't have an ego. <laughs> Turns out I did. Uh, and then it was Obstacles the Way. It's like, here's a handbook of how you get over that stuff. And then there's stillness is the key, how you enjoy that stuff. And then I got turned on to Donald, as I said at the start of the podcast. And How to Think Like a Roman Emperor might be one of the greatest books you haven't read yet. Really? And I truly mean that. Wow. Yeah. How to Think Like a Roman Emperor. Um, because Marcus really is had to had to be what he was saying he had to hmm. he had to embody the shit that he was telling other people to live and he did it and and the tip the, that's tips tricks but it's like this perception that you create around you that is so much more based in reality than it is in the feeling that you might be doing something wrong or the feeling that you could be 
uh, you know, the, the, the source of your issues. It's, it's almost like the most accountable way to live, but it has nothing to do with God or religion. It has everything to do with the fact that, hey, listen, you fucking you can completely control the reality around you by controlling how you react to it. And and it's this fucking journey that has been so incredible to me that it has changed almost every part of my life. So having him on was incredible. So I appreciate you the way yeah. story boys. No, are you oh, kidding? That was uh, that was good to watch. Like it was fun to actually like listen to. And and like JB said, he's like somebody I would listen to that guy for days on end talk. Mm -hmm. that, you know that that, like that accent and those smarts. What's that? Sorry, I like the Jordan Peterson slander at the end. That was oh my great. god, that was my was favorite. Like... That's. <laughs> Yes, oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. chef's kiss. Mm. I know. I could sit here all day and slander yeah. that man, but that's that's, that's in a Scottish thing. accent. It just feels so much better. Oh, I had no idea he was gonna. Smarter. Dude, I didn't know he was gonna carve him. Like I had no clue. And, but he did it with such grace and such um, uh, like like authority of of fact and yeah. like with the knowledge that he has in CBT and everything else. You can't refute what he just said about George. Like he literally took him out at the knees, put him yep. on a shelf, and said, "Don't, don't, don't pay attention to this." And it was that was amazing. Like I, I want to buy him a, I want to buy him a beer. <laughs> I don't know where he is. Let me buy you lunch, something. Yeah, coolest think. dude ever. Yeah, his name's Donald yeah, J. Robertson. Nice. The book is called Verissimus. Uh, you can go get it. There's the actual. Uh, it's a graphic novel. It's so cool too because it goes through a whole bunch of shit and it's pretty gross. There's some gross yeah. shit in there. Yeah. It's like <laughs> it's like watching 300, but it's like a cartoon, and it's like an introduction to Stoic philosophy, which has nothing to do with you being a wiener, by the way. In fact, the opposite. Stoics were alpha males, and I believe they are to, the, to this day. The That's true alphas? Not yeah, the yeah. ones that yell at me on Twitter that I'm not an alpha male? That's right. Like, Dude, uh, they would consider you cuck. an alpha male. Yeah, instead of a beta cuck. <laughs> I don't even know what a beta cuck is. I don't I'm, know. I'm a Zeta at this point. I don't know what they're calling me anymore. Like it's just I'm I'm going through the whole Greek alphabet towards <laughs> towards insult. <laughs> I don't know. Show was us Peterson, your Omega face. Yeah. Was, yeah. <laughs> was Peterson trending while we were on? I think he might have. Uh, always trending because he says something stupid and it it gets retweeted by the troll farm somewhere in the world and <laughs> and he's trending like it's it's yeah. I don't know. JB and I were having a conversation in the back background while you were on the show, and I said, uh, you realize that this interview has been almost two hours, but every clip for the show is coming from the last 10 minutes of that interview. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. I would, too. I would clip, like, the last 10 minutes of that and just put it up raw. Like, you mm -hmm. <laughs> Want to want to see somebody get decimated? It was yeah. elegantly eviscerated. Like I've never seen somebody disemboweled with such grace. And yeah. well, and it, but it was like the like you could like even the person being murdered should be like, thank you. That was very yeah. that was very sweet and nice. I'll show myself you did that. that. Thank you. Like, well, such a like well that was everything guy. that everybody has been saying about Peterson for a long period of time. I mean, I mean, the first you know hour and a half was about how to live a better life and the importance of making good decisions and the importance of getting a good life philosophy and value propositions and all that stuff. Battling anxiety, depression with literally objective thought, which I think is so important for people to hear. The last 20 minutes was like, <laughs> which is what I loved about him, because like I take my cues in stoicism from people like him. You know, like how are you acting on social media as a stoic or someone that embodies the philosophy of a better life? And to watch him go, what the fuck is going on with Jordan Peterson? That guy's insane. I was like, oh my god, I, well, just, I love this guy so much. This, but it, but it, but like it literally. That's why I'm so triggered by it. Is because the life I try to live and the and the things that I try to do on this planet are a di in direct contradiction to the way Jordan Peterson is. And the dude's got like six million sus followers on on uh, on YouTube. I mean, like it is, and it is none of it is based in science or or reality of cognitive and behavioral therapy or psychotherapy like none of it jordan peterson is a you just heard it there folks from one of the world's foremost psychoanalysts psychotherapists in cognitive behavioral therapy jordan peterson is a joke he is considered an international professional joke well yeah. and, and it was like he, he he talked about freud about how freud only saw six patients jordan peterson didn't see them he he does the theory and then he and then he puts his own bullshit inside the theory right he so you see people no, I don't. I don't believe no, so. I, I don't believe you just. So. I, I think you, you. You either do or you teach, and he, that's all he does is teach, right? So, yeah, I actually I had a question. You bring up a good yeah. point about this because, like, I, I was really into the interview. Like, I, I was listening to it the entire time, and um, my question is: is how do you? I wish. I wish he was here. How do you go about 
with like somebody like say somebody like a marginalized person in in, in the world like a black person or or a woman now because they're apparently marginalized uh, again and uh, uh minorities um like where you're constantly being beaten down and and the world is just shitting all over you how do you go about with that stoic sense and that stoic uh, uh like projection how do you do that like how how are you expected to do that when when you there's still there's got to be a primal search for fairness and and like and i'm not saying equality but that at least hey i need i can't just keep giving out good things and not receiving anything back like how does how do these people do this incorrect great question thanks for asking and that's my biggest concern that's my biggest struggle yeah it's about you we still we struggle with it here yeah a lot it's about but it's about you Right. It is nothing to do with your circumstances. It's accepting your circumstances and making those circumstances as good as they can possibly be under all the circumstances that you have, because that's about you. It's not about what's unfair. It's about you. You're put in a situation where you uh, are treated poorly. You have something taken away from you. Epictetus mm-hmm. is a great example. He was born a slave. And in ancient Roman Greek times, you were born into slavery and you got out when you were 30. It was like uh, coming of age as a slave. So Epictetus was purchased by this rich guy who was super abusive and he used to beat him all the time. And one night he's breaking his leg. He's like, I'm going to twist your leg till I break it. He says to Epictetus, he's like, if you do that, it's going to break. And he's like, I'm going to twist it anyway. I'm going to twist the shit out of it. Fuck you. And he's like, twisting. He goes, dude, if you do that, it'll break. Snap, it breaks. Not only was he not mad at him, not only did he not cry, Epictetus looked at him and he's like, I told you that would happen. And his entire goal after that, and he walked around with a limb for the rest of his life, was, it was to make it about trying to learn to make that existence the best existence possible by going inside, being mentally free. And he used to say it all the time. Yes, I'm a slave, but I'm more free than anybody here because no one has control over how I think. And I am not fearful of death. I'm not fearful of tomorrow. I'm not fearful of my circumstances. And that is the way. That is like the force. It is like being a Jedi to me. It's one of those things that I'm like, dude, I want to be in that situation where I can be a slave. Or like Admirable James, um, oh my God, what's his name? Vietnam. Oh, I'm no drawing a blank for a second. Uh, uh, Stockdale, Stockdale, James Stockdale. He was a practicing mm-hmm. Stoic as well, and he was a prisoner in the Hanoi Hilton. And uh, they said, "Hey, we'll let you go, but you got to re- sign this letter saying that uh, you know uh, you're a spy and all this other shit." And he's like, "No, I'm going to stay." And then they're like, "Hey, we'll let you out, but we're not going to let your friends out." Uh, and he's like, "No, that means I'm staying." And he was abused and beat and tortured for five years. And Mm -hmm. he said, I'm going to take every beating and I'm going to learn from every one of these beatings about me and about life. And then when I get out of this thing, I'm going to be so incredibly grateful to not have that life. But I'm going to take the lessons that I learned on being able to cope with that unfairness with the with with me for the rest of my life. And that's really what makes people you know, uh, bulletproof, if you will, hard things. We never go through hard things. We spend our life avoiding hard things, right? So when you go through these hard things and things are unfair and people do shit post you or someone calls you a pedophile or someone punches you in the face or someone steals your car, that is about you. It is not about anybody else because those are the people out there that have no clue. There are people out there who just think life is a smash and grab. But if you truly want to live a really good life, it's about being of good character. And to be of good character, you have to learn how to go through hard things. And to have to learn to go through hard things, you have to be able to go through hard things. There's no other way around. I I get it. I get it. But oh, I'm and and you brought you like. But it 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 almost it almost reeks of of that white privilege for us to say, oh, these oppressions that we go through being shit tweeted and whatever. I'm talking about people that go through systemic abuse constantly how can they benefit from something like this you know what i mean because it's almost like they would be giving up on trying to have the ability to um ignore shit tweets and and things like that exactly like this is what i mean like it almost it almost seems and i get it it comes from it comes from philosophy that comes from slaves but at the same time applied to modern day i think those modern day translations you guys were speaking about are something that I'd really like to read about because I think that that would probably help try and put it into context to like today's world. Mm -hmm. And hopefully there's, there's a bit of an answer in there because that's, that's what I'm thinking of is not somebody that's, you know, abusing us every once in a while, or you're going through, you know, some 
you think that the world is on you because, oh my God, my insurance went up and my, you know, like you get these stupid little fucking nothing problems. It's just that constant um, barrage of, of systemic and historic racism, prejudice, those things. It's just stuff like we can't you- get by. Yeah, and that's the thing, right? Like there's something you can't control and some things you do. It goes back to that one thing. And then making yeah. a decision to grab whatever handle is more important, right? Like yeah. we, we can't control racism. We can't control theocracy. We can't control someone shit posting us. We cannot control it. We can only re- control our response to it. Response that. to it. And, and, and I that get that part. response to it creates who you are. Right. And there's your answer is yeah. the response to something unfair has to be that experience that you go, man, this is what I got here for. This is this is the experience. Case in point, when you get fired in front of a country for being homophobic or being called homophobic when you're not, and you and you walk through the fucking yeah. wilderness for five years, you, you better learn something in there about who you are and being a better person or the experience is useless. And I look back on my life now and I go, you know what? I'm fucking so grateful for all of it. All of it. I just got to talk to a dude who I've been reading for my life. I've been reading him for my life over the past three years yeah, because of what I went through. And yep. we just got a chance to share that with people. The flywheel effect of suffering, if gone through well, can be so much more powerful than the suffering itself. And that is what I've learned. And that is why we try to become better people. And that is why we try to embrace these things that make us better and make us think a little differently as opposed to reacting to things poorly. Because I yeah. can't do that anymore, right? Yeah, I think every, and I think everybody can do that. Everybody, everybody, no matter what the situation is, is, is your response is what's key yeah. to controlling the narrative and controlling what happens after that point. Because yeah, if you don't let it um, overtake you, because you're the one that controls that option, and it is hard to, it's hard to do. I, like I get it. I've learned, I've learned a lot. It was something that I was I was sort of interested in before I met you. Then I was like, okay, somebody that's actually into it. So I'm going to dig a little deeper and 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 read some things. And it's like, you know, I think everybody does have an opportunity to benefit from this in certain day to day things if they just apply. You don't have to become like a, a like a, a staunch you know researcher and historian yeah. here. Just just apply some of those basic principles to your life, and you will be happier. Like me. The difference between Ashley and I, when we read like bullshit, like the shit that we went through yesterday on Twitter, um, I, and she's she was losing it. I'm like, who fucking cares? Whatever, just leave it alone. You know? <laughs> it's fine. And then sure enough, it's like, what do you know? We all woke no. up today. Yeah, we had a sure. wonderful breakfast this morning. We had coffee. Everyone's good. <laughs> Everybody's good. I, so. I, I had no idea about stoicism until I was sitting on Dean's couch yesterday, and he was telling me about it. And mm-hmm. that's when my cannabis drink kicked in. And I was like, I'm <laughs> way too not, Hi. I'm not able to process this. So I, I listened and I'm like, okay, I kind of get it. But yeah, in one ear out the other, I'll, I'll, I'll read about it tomorrow. It's heavy shit. Get that book that, you know what? Yeah. And I love that. I love the fact that he did it as a graphic novel because that ends up translating to anybody. Anybody yeah. can, yeah. you know what? Who doesn't it's so like accessible dude? Like, and the yeah. artwork in here is incredible. His, uh, the guy he wrote it with his name is Zay Nunu Fragra. Uh, he's a Portuguese artist, and uh, it's called Verissimus. You can get it wherever you get your fine pot. In this uh, description of this podcast on YouTube, but there's a bunch of different links where you can go and buy not just that, but you can also buy How to Think Like a Roman Emperor, uh, Stoicism and the Art of Happiness, all the other stuff, uh, which there you go. Ryan's been kind enough to throw that up there, Donald J. Robinson. But follow him on Twitter because he's cool. He just And he writes for Medium as well because he, mm-hmm. he likes to share his information with people. Uh, but follow him. Follow him on social uh, as well. One of the things I did really just start because I was fucking nervous to start that podcast, right? Because I, I knew this I'm was going to be a long one, too. I knew. I said, Dean's doing this for nine hours. There's no, no way he's do. letting this guy go. I was fanboying. I was totally <laughs> yeah, fanboying. It was great. And, well, I didn't rush home. I'm like, okay, 415. <laughs> Yeah, I wandered in the door at four, got cut down, logged in. I'm like, yeah. Sorry. As I'm fanboying and I've got all my slides set up, right? Like I've got some stuff about uh, stoicism, like his, you know, his modern stoicism website, which, by the way, is incredible. If any of that touched you in any way or you want to learn more, go to modernstoicism.com. No obligation, not religion. Go fuck yourself. That's how I feel about it. Um, But I'm... I was we were. I knew we were going to talk about uh, I saw, Hunter Biden. I saw, today. You, I saw what you did. I was. Laughing. I knew we were going to talk about Hunter Biden today, and the reason why we're talking about Hunter Biden is because uh, some hackers got into his iPhone and his iCloud account, 
Yeah. And and it's like a fucking national emergency now because it's treasure trove. There's so much nudity, <laughs> so much cocaine. And and let me say this. I am just Biden. hearing of this. I, He's this got a decent wang on him. He's got a decent hammer. I saw a bunch of videos of him running around naked. Mm -hmm. um, but more importantly, just terrible photos. Anyway, and videos. Like, awful. We got a couple here I'll share with you. Hopefully, we keep our YouTube account. No idea if we will or not. Yeah, careful. Um, but I'm five minutes into the interview, and I'm introducing him. I'm like, so here's your modern stoicism website. And the first slide I bring up is this <laughs> <laughs> picture of... Hunter Biden drilling some <laughs> Russian model from behind. I'm like, oh my god, oh my god. Messages like that. What? Uh, oh yeah, did you not hear? Uh, so anyway, my apologies to Don. He was really cool about it, though. He's like, yeah, don't worry about it. I'm like, Fuck yeah. Total yeah. Um, yeah, but the the uh, have you not seen any of the Hunter Biden shit yet? I've missed Dude. this. Completely missed my radar. Like, oh my god! Completely. So what happened? Like 4chan, some hackers on 4chan hacked his iPhone and his iCloud. They've always they've always had it. They've had the um, they've had the data for a long time, and they've been you know the whole Hunter Biden laptop thing, yeah. thing that we've heard mm -hmm. since Biden was um, elected as president. So now, after the midterms, is when um, shit's starting to get dirty. Uh, on both sides, of course, we've seen the leaks coming from the uh, the Lincoln Project for the, the the left, and then now, 4chan. I guess there was some whoever's controlling the the deal over there. So my my guess is is got something to do with January sixth, and the January sixth hearing um, that's coming up tomorrow is supposed to be explosive. And now all of a sudden, um, uh, what's his name? The guy that looks like Meatloaf. Uh, that was advising the president. Steve there. Bannon. Steve Bannon. He's, uh, I mean, Meatloaf today. Like if you were to dig Meatloaf up, <laughs> if you were going to dig Meatloaf up, that's what he would look like is Steve Bannon right now. Um, and what uh, he's, uh, he's, he said that, oh, I'll testify. That's fine. And Donald Trump has waived the invisible privilege that he didn't actually Executive possess. Or whatever. Yeah, but he didn't, he didn't possess it in the first place. So nobody knows what he's talking about. But there's more uh, explosive bombshelly stuff coming out tomorrow at twelve thirty. So all of a sudden, there's Hunter Biden's son, or sorry, Hunter Biden, Joe Biden's son, um, pictures of him with uh, hookers, videos of him weighing crack cocaine on a scale and arguing with a prostitute about how much crack is actually there. The guy's a mess. Don't get me wrong, um, but it's not Joe Biden. You know, like nobody's going after Baron Trump to show you what a piece of shit kid that guy is. Um, if he is, I don't know if he is, but uh, it's that distraction thing, right? It's the left versus right, and they'll use anything. And sure, I, I was entertained by it. Like, good, you know, I'll, I'll look at whatever Hunter Biden mess of a life the, the, the guy leads. Um, yeah. No problem. Uh, that, 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 but it's not going to sway my opinion on what a person Joe Biden is. So I, I've never understood these. I've never understood these attacks. Like they don't. They don't make a whole lot of sense to me. It's just distraction. It's just. It, yeah, they know tomorrow something bad's going to happen around John so, Donald Trump. Yeah. And it's like get on it. Sorry, JB. What were you going to say? Well, I was just going to say it's almost like you know people with an ounce of intelligence can have different bandwidth for things. Like we can look at the Hunter Biden thing and go, all right, that's entertaining, but also go, oh, January sixth hearings are tomorrow. You can do two things. It's yeah. not like, oh, Hunter Biden focus 100% of our energy on that. Screw yeah. the January 6th stuff. Screw this. Screw that. We got to focus on that. No, you can look at multiple things and, and, and talk about it, right? Like, it just doesn't. But our side, if you want to call it our side, uh, actually looks at it and says, okay, there's a lot of stuff going on. But yeah. the with, especially with these QAnon nuts, they, they hyper-focus on one particular thing and can't focus on anything else. And well, I think it's because there's nothing else like even the idea. And Lynn said it best. Like, this isn't Joe Biden. Like, he, he didn't get caught with a crack pipe. He didn't got caught weighing crack. By the way, there's a lot of crack in, on, on his phone. He <laughs> loved Hunter Biden loved crack. This is a yeah. picture of him. Uh, looks great. Smoking some crack in this the shower. <laughs> yeah. At least he's clean. <laughs> This is a Best picture. Of, these are some of the leaked pictures that were, that were put out on Reddit. The ones that I can put up. Obviously, yeah. we're not going to put the ones of him dancing around with a huge hammer. Uh, that's a picture of him with one of the hookers. Uh, I won't. And the reason why I cropped it at the phone is because, again, you can see his wiener. 
Uh, she's taking a picture of it, it seems. Yeah, she is. She's taking a picture <laughs> of a wang. a selfie with a wang. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this is the bottom half of that, or that's the top half of that picture. As you can see, he's <laughs> naked. That's the same picture. But there's Hunsky. There's a guy. He loves Russian hookers. Yeah. Huge fan. There is, oh, yeah, this is a picture of all of them. This is a picture of his passport. This is all shit that was on his phone. Yeah. That got hacked and then just spilled onto Reddit, I think, late last night, early today. You guys want to see a video? Sure. This is this is great. I look through it's the one. stuff on my phone now, and I'm like, this isn't that bad compared to the stuff on no, my just... phone. Jesus. Yeah, Christ. right? I'm like, yeah, who okay. Jay, can, can I ask a question yeah, just to yeah. uh, round the horn here? Sure. Anybody got pictures like this no. of of your debauchery? Like, because we, we all have debauchery in our life. Okay, don't don't mm -hmm. fucking lie. Everybody nope. has some sort of debauchery in their life or in their past. Not me. Anybody have recorded evidence of it on their phone that could be easily nope. hacked? Yes. <laughs> oh, I oh. do. I, I record. <laughs> What's my wrong debauchery? with you? No, I put my debauchery up on the internet for yeah. people for money. That's so true. That, okay, I, that's not debauchery though. That's that, yeah, I'm talking that's about only like fans. Yeah. That's, that's only fans. That's money. That's, that's, yeah, that's what I'm saying is if he's going to put like himself, like if let's say JB, let's just say for the sake of saying, he pulls one off and he takes a picture of himself yanking his doodle, takes a mm -hmm. video. JB isn't the kind of guy that goes, I'm just going to keep that on my phone and send it to people. JB is the kind of guy that's like, I'm going to throw that up on my OnlyFans account. Tell every all 200,000 of my followers. Monetize like, it. You want to see my wiener, you go right ahead. Give me five bucks yeah. and insurers. Like he, he's not. He has there's no such thing as contraband on his phone. Doesn't and matter what it it's is. It's in a locked folder behind a passcode. It's so it's not like if somebody got my phone, they would be able to accurately get it. It's behind multiple barriers, right? I don't think I, crackheads are that technically inclined to sure. put passwords on folders, though, possibly. That mm. might be why. I just don't understand the 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 Can was he doing video? it to like blackmail people? Let's like, play the video and ask those questions. Okay. Instead of yeah, let's play the video. This is him. I think this is him. Yeah. Okay. This is a good one. This yes. is him. <laughs> and it looks like he's in a fucking flop house. This is the president's son. I know. Looks like he's in a, like literally a crack house, which makes sense because he seems to be buying crack in this video. But yeah. this is him weighing out the crack and making sure he gets <laughs> its money's worth. Watch this. <laughs> Here he is. Yeah. 20 grams. Zero seven. Without a bag. Two point zero. Did you hear that? Twenty point seven. Not twenty one. Twenty. It's got to be exact. It does go to twenty one though. I think I, I'm. I got to side with the the crack whore. Um, she's right. Uh, it you was twenty one. She's a whore. Point. She just might be selling crack. You can't. Sorry, have sorry. Crack, crack cocaine time. prostitute. Yeah. Um, she. Uh, Entrepreneur. Yeah. Self starter. <laughs> That's unbelievable. That's, That's a lot of crack. Set. That is it. I've never seen crack before this close. To be honest with you, there it is. That's There's the twenty one. Uh, yeah, and he's like twenty point seven. Where's the <laughs> point three? I gave you two hundred dollars. He's blowing on it, <laughs> and he looks like shit in that video too. This is the uh, video of the screenshot someone took. This is pretty funny. It's him. Well, I don't know if it's funny. Actually, I don't know if drug addiction is that funny anymore. <laughs> No, it's not. It's not it funny, be. but it's entertaining. That's for sure. This is him trying to light a crack pipe. <laughs> that's crack pipe, right? I'm but, just assuming. But here's the thing: yeah. he's unlike Donald Trump. He's not. Joe Biden didn't make him a senior member of the administration. Probably it's for a son. reason. It's yeah. it's it's Joe Biden's son. That's fine. We could you yeah. can say that to, all day. But mm -hmm. this man has no, uh, like no clearance within the, the the current White House that I'm aware of. I could be wrong about that, but um, he he's not a senior advisor. He's not making public policy. No, right? He's just he's just doing crack. Yeah, like, it's and that's kind of it, right? <laughs> and I understand. Uh, like I was I was being facetious and joking earlier. Crackheads are normally. Um, pretty paranoid. So that's why he probably videotaped it for mm -hmm. some sort of evidentiary purpose in his own mind. Yeah. And and now right wing extremists and and hackers are taking advantage of that paranoia that that a drug addict, I, I believe, reform drug addict. These are very old, apparently, as well. Yeah, I believe um, he's clean now. I believe he's clean now. So a, a a reformed drug addict is now having his past ripped 
from him and put on display uh, to, I don't know, um, own his dad, own the libs. We're doing yeah, this to own you the need libs. The decision, dude. Like, that's the thing. It comes down to personal responsibility. This guy, like, his, Joe Biden knew his kid was crazy. <laughs> like, knew he <laughs> loved crack and loved coke. And, like, this guy had sex with his dead brother's wife after his brother died. I mean, he's just yeah. a terrible fucking human being. Yeah. And he was like a ridiculous drug addict. And if he's clean now, great. But these yep. receipts exist because he lived a shitty life and he was a shitty individual, did shitty things. And he's embarrassing his dad now, right? And everybody had these. Like, yeah. you know, these these pictures and videos have been existing for a long time. And they were waiting until they absolutely needed a nuclear option. And that nuclear option might it's be here. tomorrow. Right. Yeah. yeah like yeah. the January 6th thing. And I don't know what's even going on tomorrow. I have no idea who they're talking to. Does anybody know? Anybody Steve know who Bannon. Steve Bannon was uh, very, very close to the inner workings of Donald Trump, especially around the. What is he going to be live tomorrow? Yeah. I think it's tomorrow. He, he's agreeing yeah, tomorrow. to do a public hearing. I'm not he's sure. Doing, I don't know if that's tomorrow's, but there's a, there's a public hearing again tomorrow. It's not it's not as uh, um, secretive, I don't think, as uh, as the last one was. But uh, yeah, tomorrow at twelve thirty, they're doing another one. Yeah, PBS on YouTube will have it uh, live yeah. streamed. Yeah, I'm sure everybody. But it's, would be it's 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 terrible. So yeah, um, I wonder I got, if that had. I got to jump. To... I got to jump out just for a sec, boys. I'll yeah, be right I... back. I wonder if uh, that had anything to do, JB, with uh, the internet going on on the weekend. You know, some will make claims. Uh, me sitting my ass down outside of a public library till 1130 at night trying to stay connected uh, was I just want an answer. I want to yeah. know what happened. Right. And yeah. and, you know, we can sit here and speculate. And there's been tons of reports come out from very, very smart people that are smarter than you and I to say, like, hey, this is kind of what happened. But I don't think we'll ever really know. I don't think Rogers is going to to say anything. Are you happy with? Well, they did say something yesterday. They're like, update. Just kind of po pooched the update. <laughs> yeah, we hit we hit a button. The button didn't do what it's expected. Uh, uh, that's but that's that's what I've been. I don't know. I talk to a lot of people in the business, and I know you do too. Mm -hmm. Um, but like people much smarter than me, guys that uh, like sources contacts with groups like Cloudfare, uh, and other organizations that understand how this stuff works are like something fishy here, man. That yeah. is, that is not how it works. Are you kind of, have you been hearing the same stuff? Yeah. So for context, uh, I'm not going to say what I used to do, but I used to do a lot of work in one blur where mm -hmm. Rogers headquarters is. And from what I remember, and I said this to you yesterday, uh, that floor where the network operations center is, is ridiculously secure. Like it, you can't get in unless you have specific clearance to get in. And for all I know, behind that door could be a hamster and a wheel that's running the Rogers network. That seems to be what's actually behind that door uh, with what happened on Friday. But uh, all I know is there's a lot of nerdy folks that came in and out of that door. Uh, and that was that. Mm -hmm. So, um, Hopefully they figured it out and hopefully they, they can provide some sort of answer. But if it was an attack or some sort of, you know, breach, we're never going to know. They're never going to say it. No. And, and you know, it's because I wrote a piece about it because we, again, inundated with people who are like, bro, I don't know. I'm not buying that. And I'm like, as senior as it gets in this cloud for, I won't even get into who these people are, but three or four people, four to be precise, three who really gave us great information. They said, no, it's not how it works. Um, upgrading firmware, someone says the device is a fail. What they're saying is it didn't have backup uh, device to run on while the upgrade was happening. They didn't have one just in case the first one died. I think they were cryptoed, this guy says, and they had to dig through server backups to find ones that weren't infected. That's why it took so long and not everything was back online at once. Some servers may still be down or running off very old backups. Uh, and they pointed out that Rogers was also ransomed in 2015, but the data was stolen. They didn't pay, and a large amount of client information was released. Um, but it, it's bigger than that. It's like, not only do we not know, but any excuse they give us doesn't even get challenged. Right. Like, and it's not even important to challenge it because the real issue is not a hacker. If it was a targeted attack, we don't know that it was, nor do I give a fuck if it was to be totally honest with you. But the problem is the monopoly that these companies have in this country to that point. Kai Prigg, who's the senior vice president, you told me about this yesterday because yeah. we were over for barbecue. We had a nice barbecue. We were sitting around shooting the shit, and it made me laugh. I'm like, there's a video of this? You're like, yeah, there is. Oh, yeah. Kai Prigg, senior VP of Rogers Network Connections or whatever the fuck uh, is on his business. Network senior operations, VP. I think. They're network operations. Um, doing an interview with Vassy Capellas from Power and Politics on CBC. Now, this is fucking hilarious because 
at the time that the outage happened, Rogers was literally in a meeting with the Competition Bureau of Canada trying to take over Shaw, which would give them an even bigger monopoly, uh, basically co-opting 90% of telecommunications business in this country between themselves and Rogers. So at the time, they're in a meeting and all of Rogers' internet goes down. All of Rogers' wireless goes down. And they're like, this is going to be great for Canadians. And someone looks across the table and like, hey, you want to tell us why your entire network is out there, fella? <laughs> yeah, or did the Zoom call just drop? And then they're like, oh, where did Rogers go? That frozen uh, face. And well, Shaw's they... sitting there like, well, this is awkward. Yeah. Right? <laughs> You want to be our internet provider, huh? Yeah. Well, you're gonna you're gonna have you want to be my latex salesman. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible internet provider slash latex salesman. But this is Kai Prig uh, being asked, "Hey, listen, do you think you guys should be allowed to monopolize tele telecommunications in this country? Wait for the lawyer to come swooping in on this phone call. This is fucking so possibly one of the funniest videos you'll ever see. Watch." Your company is pitching a merger with Shaw that would further monopolize the market. How much responsibility does your company bear for the sheer number of Canadians who are affected by this? I, I can't get into discussions on the merger with Shaw. Um, we, we're so focused on recovering the situation here, so I, 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 I couldn't possibly comment on that. What about the degree to which the market is monopolized, though? That is something that your company has lobbied, you know, for years. I can't talk about the monopolization in, in Canada right now. I'm focused on the recovery efforts, as you can imagine, right? So you're, you're keeping I, me I'm from sorry, the incident room. So. Yes, okay. I do understand that, sir. I'm just asking on behalf of Canadians. Thank you. <laughs> you can hear the team's messages in the back, too. Yes. So like, get the fuck off. What are you doing? Shut up. Like, end this. Like, you can hear the panic. And the look on his face when they said it, like, he's like, yeah. looks like he got hit by a two by four in the back of the head. Just like, like, pure shock. Like, this man's trying to fix a network that went down Canada wide. Yeah. Like, and yes, he's being mm. asked about monopolies, but it's a fair question to ask and, his SVP. Right? And how he's not prepared for a question like that, especially in the climate well, that we're in. Well, it's not even that he's not prepared, dude. He can't, he's not even a, like, yeah, you can guarantee well, he went into this interview and there's a lawyer sitting there on the call because you heard her, right? Yep. Let's, we'll play it for you again. And she's like, if you say a fucking word about the you're fired. <laughs> So I've one, been fucking, you'll be pulling quarters out of pay phones and yeah, Poughkeepsie, yeah. you fuck. I, I've been in calls <laughs> with SVPs from Rogers before, mm -hmm. right? Like either internal calls or even external calls with, with other organizations, right? I don't think I can count a single time where we had counsel on the call. Like at all. Like we'd be talking to vendors, we'd be talking to third parties. Counsel was never on that call. It's probably so, a media thing. It's probably, yeah. I would imagine it's a media thing. It may not have or, been counsel. It could have been media relations. It could have been somebody, you know, in a different department that's speaking yeah. up. You're like, hey, dude, shut up. Like, yeah. it's, it's, uh, couldn't necessarily be counsel. I'm just assuming it's counsel. But. Well, let's watch it one more time. This is the fucking best thing I've seen all week. By the it's way. Your so company good. is pitching a merger with Shaw that would further monopolize the market. How much responsibility does your company bear for the sheer number of Canadians who are affected by this? I, I can't get into discussions on the merger with Shaw. Um, we, we're so focused on recovering the situation here, so I, 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 I couldn't possibly comment on that. What about the degree to which the market is monopolized, though? That is something that your company has lobbied, you know, for years. I can't talk about the monopolization in, in Canada right now. I'm focused on the recovery efforts, as you can imagine, right? So you're, you're keeping me I'm from sorry, the incident room. So. Right I, yes. okay. I do understand that, sir. I'm just asking on behalf of Canadians. Thank you. Did you, did you hear? Did you hear him? He's like, I can't talk about the monopoly right now. <laughs> it's the same. It's the same answer every time too. So he was prepped, right? And every time he said the right thing, the bing went off. Bing, good job, buddy. No, no, bing. that was. Do you know what the bing was? That was the lawyer. I think chiming in on the call, right? That was the lawyer, like going, "Oh, I'm taking my microphone off for this one because I need to tell you to shut the fuck up." <laughs> Somebody yelled, running in the background as soon yeah. as the question was asked. Too, that was my favorite. <laughs> Holy fuck. <laughs> Pull the plug. Tell him to shut up. <laughs> X-Nay on the Amopoly, eh? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, li listen, uh, every Cloudfair guy that contacted us this weekend, because we, we were, like, wondering 
if this is a targeted attack. And again, it doesn't matter because monopoly is a problem. The Canadian government's actually the problem. Yeah. But um, uh, and they need to allow for competition. And if they don't, this is just going to keep happening again. But here's the thing: even if it wasn't a targeted attack, the admission that they had no idea what was going on and they were still trying to reclaim stuff. And there are a lot of people that are still don't have any service across this country, by the way. But still, that still do not have service. Yeah. But is that not just an admission that you're totally incompetent at the one thing that you say that you do? And is that not just another reason to not allow these guys to grow anymore? Because they fucked, literally fist fucked, 14 million Canadians for two straight days. And there are still hundreds of thousands that they're giving it to that pay a price. And here's the great part. Yesterday, they're like, we're going to give you two days credit. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, and, and and it was and if you and if you I broke mine down yesterday, Dean. Yeah. Did you do yours yet? Yeah, I think I lost twelve million. Eleven dollars. I'm getting back. Yeah. Um, they're going to credit me about eleven bucks uh, if it goes by what the VP said uh, they were going to give out as proactive credits, and you don't have to call. We're just going to be nice and give this to you without question. That's nice of them. So out of my three hundred and fifty dollar a month bill that I pay on average, I'm going to get 11 bucks for not having a cell phone for a day and a half. What about and, my, and TV and internet and what about yeah. my lost revenue from not being able to stream Friday night? Like I well, get paid per stream, right? So, yeah. you know, I didn't, I wasn't online that night. So Twitch isn't going to pay me. They're going to be like, all right, well, you didn't go that night. And I have the freedom to do that, but like, it's not my fault. Twitch isn't going to pay out because my internet was of course down, not. Right. Mm-hmm. So Rogers, I, I'm not going to sit there and yell at some guy on a call center. Like, it's not his fault, right? But, mm. you know, that's money out of my pocket. And it, that's just one, you know, anecdotal time, right? What about this? I went to go to my local watering hole, my friend's bar, because I thought maybe they would have internet and I can at least set up and, and have a drink. Closed. They're done. They just closed for the day. There's a revenue gone. They yeah. lost what about their business that day. People so. that phoned 911 and got rerouted to somewhere in Buffalo and yeah. then grandma died of a heart attack because 911 couldn't get their shit together and somebody in Lackawanna County was trying they to get 11 bucks. They get two days credit. That dead relative yeah. gets two days credit on the Rogers cell phone Buy bill. Buy some Here you go. Actually, they'll probably, they'll probably nail them with a early cancellation fee because uh, yeah, their grandma's the way, contract grandma wasn't died. up. You got to pay all the way to the end of July, by the way. So. Uh, <laughs> and there was an emergency. Oh, don't forget about the disconnection fee. You lost another yeah. 200. Yeah. There was a, an emergency in Saskatchewan where the government put out an emergency alert that did not go yeah. to Rogers customers, Rogers yep. Fido Chatter customers, because they had no service. There was an active shooter mm-hmm. in roaming around a neighborhood that they put out an emergency alert for, and everybody in that region that was on Rogers just didn't get it. So. You know, thankfully nothing happened, but it could have. Yeah. What? What? What if? The what ifs. We yeah. Sit here and talk about the what ifs all day, but, and I, I have no doubt there's going to be a class action from this. Like, oh, like if be. if Interact doesn't do it, they have the dumbest lawyers on the planet. <laughs> like well, if Interact just announced today, which I thought was funny, is that we're going to get a second operator. We're going to get we're going to use Rogers, but we're just going to get another one to make sure because Rogers is incompetent apparently, so we're going to hire another company as a backup to that original company, which means this. They basically already told Rogers, "We're out. We're going to go with somebody else because this yeah. is the second time this has happened in a year." And that was Canada wide, by the way. And and just so you guys know, 11 bucks if you're going to both get 11 bucks back, good news. Stacy had to take off Friday. She gets nothing back. And uh, Danielle Baker, just a two-day prorated refund. She's going to get $3.56 back. Whoa. Yeah. Isn't that great? Look, we should all just rip up Tim Hortons with our credits. <laughs> like, we should just all, like, uh, Tim bits for everybody. Like, yeah, that's it. Indeed. Um, JB brought up a good point uh, yesterday when we were talking about it, though, about the European model, the way it works over there. And why they don't do it here is beyond me, but it's not beyond me because it's a monopoly. Have to. Yeah, they, and that's kind of it, right? So, in Europe, JB, tell tell us how, how do they do it over there? Like, if uh, if so a cell phone provider goes down, there there's like seven of them to pick from, and they're all independent, and they're all European based. So, like Vodafone's out of Germany, but goes all over Europe. Then you got um, uh, Ear, which is I I R E, which is from Ireland, which goes all over Europe. Like they're they're these massive, massive, massive companies, but they all own their own networks. They are all independent from each other. And the beauty is, is that your phone is you can still finance a phone through your carrier, but it's not tied to your plan. So if I go to Vodafone and say, 
you know, I want to buy an iPhone. They can just sell me an iPhone for a monthly cost per month, but I could take that iPhone, walk over to a different provider and put a SIM card in it. So if the, if that provider goes down I'm like, all right, I guess I'm jumping to another provider this month. It's all prepaid too. Like it's not contracts. It's not anything like that. You're free. Yeah. So it's, it's, you're, you're free to do whatever you want. You can just walk in. Hey, I'm going to be, uh, it, 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 to translate it here. I'm Telus. uh, shit. Telus isn't working. I'll grab my Rogers card, jam my Rogers card in and I'm good to go. Yeah. And when and, in uh, for roaming too, like when I go to Europe, I'm a Rogers customer. I'll jump between different networks because they have agreements with literally everybody. So it's like, who's giving me the strongest signal here? Oh, Vodafone is? Guess I'm on Vodafone now. Like there's there's none of this extremely contractual based competition that you're in this country. This is this is the only one there. And obviously that varies based off of European countries, but in the big Western ones, it's pretty the competition is is very vast. Yeah. Very vast. Um and we don't have that system because don't have yeah, there's two people own it all. That's oh, it. Yeah. They don't have to. They have <laughs> make have us to. is what they're saying. And, and they have a government body that fucking supports this and and backs it up and 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 just enables it. Yeah. And we had a chance. We had it's a chance. Not unlike North Korea when it comes to comes to telecommunications, well, it's like we don't know any different. And uh, the, com- the 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 advertising that 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 Rogers Bell tell us pour into our brains over like you know i don't know the last five to seven to ten years which is why they bought all the radio and all the television and all the other stuff is like we need to keep people snowed about these rates we got to keep people thinking we're a good like a really nice company that likes to fucking recycle we got to make people think that we're the number one this and without us they'd be fucked no television no phone you'll never be able to and so what what they've done effectively over the past like you know, six, seven years is like, let's flood the marketplace with ideas and put ideas into these people's heads that everything's fine. Nothing to see here. We're keeping you safe. And when meanwhile, the only thing that really matters is if they can take a direct deposit out of your account every month for three to five hundred dollars. None of these guys give a shit about you as a person. No. So those commercials that you see where it's like, I love working for Bell because they buy green <laughs> trucks. They buy EVs. <laughs> or when you see Rogers, like, Rogers is making a difference this Halloween by putting out, like, Halloween guys to make sure no one gets kidnapped. It's like, yeah. they don't give a fuck about oh, that, P-R. and they probably aren't even doing half of it. And even if, if they were, it wouldn't even matter to their bottom line. It's like, let's just keep the fucking bullshit train going to convince everybody that we're not triple charging them globally for yeah. everything that we do. <laughs> and let don't whatever you do, don't talk about the European SIM card bit. Because everybody's yeah. going to freak out. They're going to want the why Asian can you, system. Why can Nothing. I get 120 gigabytes for five bucks? Why? Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Even the, it's pretty bad when you look down south and you look at the United States that has way better plans and, and options than Canada. Like when have we ever said that that's a thing? Yeah. We mm-hmm. always do better than the United States. And this is we're lacking in the entire world. Like we pay. I think it's the highest rates in yeah, the, the highest. developed country. Right. So, or sorry, in the developed world. Our country pays the highest rates for those. Um, to your point about the radio stations, they didn't buy these. Like when people, and, and I know we we rag on on terrestrial radio a lot, um, but the, at the same in the same breath, there's a reason for it. When you listen and you hear your favorite DJ that you used to love just disappear, and nobody fucking talks about it, nobody cares, and then they Hi. just put right, they just put like a a, a, a pre recorded thing, guys doing bits, you know, like just garbage that we've played bits on here that are just absolute trash. It's not they didn't buy the radio station because they care about the radio station. They don't even care about making money with the radio station. The they community. want it for advertising. They're literally it's a free avenue of fucking filling you with Bell and Rogers commercials constantly during the during sorry during the goddamn outage that morning on a all news radio station in Toronto, one of the highest rated fucking news stations that that it, it, it is owned by by a Rogers uh, subsidiary was playing commercials on how Rogers is the most reliable network across Canada while everybody was screaming going, where I can't use my fucking phone. I can't even call the radio station to complain about your commercial. Yeah. Like, you know, like it's so, it's so stu- it's so in front of your face, but yeah. 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 And uh, you know, when I, when I was in terrestrial radio, we were under the chum organization and the chum organization got bought by Bell media. Yeah. And um, when they purchased Bell, when Bell media bought us, they said, nobody's going to lose their jobs. Everyone's, you're still going to be a community-driven radio station. I'm like, okay, sure, yeah. Five years later, 
Well, no, like three years later, I was let go. Like, oh, okay, how about that thing you said about nobody's going to lose my job and my show got turned into a syndicated show that was broadcast across Canada? Like, not me directly, but, like, my time slot was replaced by syndication. You're yeah. saying they lied? That's so weird. <laughs> and I got I got let go on Bell It's Talk Day, which is another rant. That that's the that. day. Yeah. Dude, it's that's the day, the day everybody it's gets the fired. day of yeah. culling. Do you want to have a look at European rates versus Canadian rates? Please. Oh, this my I've, friend I've Amy. Yeah. Yeah. My friend Australia, Amy from yeah. uh, the uh, Gritty Nurse podcast, Amy Archibald yep. Barley. She's awesome. In Canada, we pay, we pay too much for cell phone services, internet services. She's like, Canada, $75 for 10 gigabytes max speed. Uh, Australia, 45 for 30. <laughs> from Vodafone, which is a European company. Which... Uh, 95 for 20 gig. Uh, Australia, 55 for 80. How about, how about the most expensive plan? 120 gigs in Australia, 65. Canada, 125 for 50. So Ooh. a third you pay double for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is why, man, they have kept you snowed. And, you know, we're all like this. Oh, whatever, I need it. So you got to take it out. And there's nothing you can do. Where are you going to go? Because, yeah, they Where are going to go. Right? And the other thing, too, that they love to do is they'll say, you know, we have plenty of competition in Canada. If you don't like Rogers prices, go to Fido. Guess who owns Fido? Rogers. Rogers. Oh, you don't like Fido prices? That's still a little bit too much. Well, why don't you try our prepaid brand, Chatter, which is also owned by Rogers. Yeah. And Bell has their three, Virgin and Lucky, and Telus has their three, Kudo and Public Mobile. Yep. So of these six Freedom. carriers, Freedom, I think is nine one carriers, yeah. there is three owners. Freedom's their own thing, but they're 49% owned by Shaw, which is soon going to be owned by Rod Rogers. No, Freedom is owned by Shaw, which is soon yeah. going to be owned by Rogers. Exactly. Like, I don't know. Like, There's no competition. We can sit here and say, yes, you can go to a mall and see 20 different cell phone booths, but that's not competition because in the end of the day, there's just three platforms that are being activated. On. That's yeah. it. It's Yeah, but it's the bait and switch where they're like, hey, I get it. Here's a, you know what? We'll send you the competition instead of Rogers. Go to Freedom Mobile. And you're like, <laughs> well, you own it. Go to Chat. Yeah. Well, you own that too. Fido, you own that. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, yeah. you well, know, they scoop up the ones that are scary, right? Yeah. Fido was an independent company. Rogers bought them. Virgin was independent. Bell bought yeah. them. Yeah. Uh, Chatter was independent. Rogers bought them. Mm -hmm. uh, there was this one that was called, oh, um, well, Public Mobile. Public mm -hmm. Mobile was supposed to be the the industry killer. They were going to build their own network. They were going to do the whole thing. Tell us about them. Like, it's just, and then they they either shut it down or incorporate it in there. And Freedom, which is Shaw, is going to go through the same motions. Like, we'll see what happens with the merger. But I, if I was a Freedom Mobile employee right now, I would be popping up my little LinkedIn and saying, looking for opportunities. Because I don't <laughs> think that's going to be sticking around much longer yeah, under, right. under, under Roger Shaw. I just well, it just every purchase is an excuse to keep that price up, and every purchase is an excuse to go find duality and fire more people and get a little thinner and get a little leaner. And, and man, we are boiled frogs in this country. And if you had a problem with that outage on Friday, you were one of 14 million people, there is going to be a class action lawsuit, by the way. I just heard that yesterday. Oh, wow. Is yeah. that there is going to be a class action lawsuit on behalf? I don't know who's doing it. I don't know who's going to be leading the charge. I know that people are tied, but it is not tied to the outage. It's tied to why that outage was allowed to continue for two days and the fact that that should never happen. And I don't know if there's going to be an inquiry, but apparently the, you know, and fuck, I, the government is in thick with these guys. So who gives a shit? But the minister in charge of communications, this country champagne, dude, he's like, I'll be looking into this. I'm like, I fucking don't trust you at all. So you're probably not <laughs> looking, looking into it by this. getting an email from the CEO of Rogers being like, it's fine. And he'll go, yeah. OK, <laughs> I was uh, reassured that everything is OK. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like <laughs> They told me inquiry everything over. is fine. <laughs> That's what uh, I mean. Like a public inquiry. There needs to I think I think boiled frog analogy is actually perfect because we've 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 gotten to the point where we've become so dependent on this. Everything you heard about yesterday was how did you deal with it? Oh my god, did you play board games with your kids? Did you just talk to people in real life? Oh my god, I can't believe it. This is so nice. We we're literally slaves to these stupid fucking things, right? So yeah. we we we've trained ourselves to I don't it's just like let's talk about Hunter Biden. <laughs> Let's just get it. I don't care how I got to get it. Just give it to me. I, I, Jad, let's film it. I don't care. Just here. Give me that thing. I need it. We're addicted to this shit. And we, and like you say, we had a chance. We spearheaded 
the the announcements and and tried to make people understand listen this is what's going to happen and now it actually like you saw it everybody finally actually kind of like got jolted out of their twitter and went oh my god my phone doesn't work and saw it happen this is why places like um uh our friends at tech savvy were like spearheading that thing yeah don't fucking deal with it anymore don't don't like don't don't just settle for this shit. You don't have to settle for this. We, we've we been trying to tell this. We've been telling you this forever. There's a way out of this. And you didn't listen. And then just, they got away with it again. And I'm so, like, I, I just, I'm so fed up with it. It's a, it, when the answer is right in front of you, you could, you could have done something and nobody gave a shit. Yeah, okay, well, whatever. If I could, I just got this sent to me. Um, <clears throat> breaking, Minister Champagne has requested Canada's telecoms enter in a formal agreement within 60 days to provide mutual assistance during an outage, provide emergency roaming, and implement communications protocol. Not that uh, Canada's minister uh, has asked Rogers and Bell to uh, lower their rates and has opened it up to more competition. So this doesn't happen again. It's like, no, he's allowing them to help each other can continue to keep, <laughs> hold us hostage no matter what happens in this country. Well, and what happened to the free market? We're supposed to be this capitalist country of, of free market. Like you saw those prices you put up earlier. You know, the prices in Australia are from Vodafone. And that's a European company. That's the company that own not owns, but is one of the biggest carriers in Europe. Mm -hmm. Australia has let them in and look at the prices that they can offer because they come with money. They come with expertise. They can come with into a country and say, we can build a network. You don't think Vodafone could pop up a network in Canada with the money that they have in their coffers? Like well, for sure. A year? Easy, easy. Like it's not, it, I'm not saying it's easy, but like with the money that Vodafone and AT&T or Verizon or all these other major telecom companies have, um, they could easily pop something up. 90% of the Canadian uh, Canadians live within 100 miles of the U.S. border. You don't think AT&T can just pop up some strategic towers in certain areas and boom, cover and a large chunk of Canadian population? That's like, it. And we've been we've been fed a warm milk story from, from uh, our government and from these companies the entire time of, well, the infrastructure is already here. We already have that. It's it's uh, the infrastructure is very um, established. We can't just go running new poles, and we don't need poles anymore. We've we've oh, gotten they out share of the a tower. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Is it possible to order a SIM card from another country? Yeah. Yes, it is, oh, and we actually have um, agreements with other providers for roaming services. Now, no, if no, the... but like, can I can I phone? Can I get in touch with people at Vodafone and go? I'll hit my credit card for ten bucks a month. Yep. Five million gigs a month. Go ahead. Just send me the SIM card. It, does that exist? Oh, yes, it does. The problem is, Pot. is most carriers have Here a three month rule. So if you are roaming yeah. in in your or three or six months, it depends on your whatever your country's rules are. Mm -hmm. But I know for American carriers, because I looked into this when I lived in Niagara, I could pick up AT&T towers in my bedroom, not at work. But I would what would it cost for me to get an AT&T SIM card? Rome, not Rome when I'm sitting in my house because I could pick up the U.S. towers. But when I go to work, I'll roam. I'll pay the cost. If you are outside of the coverage area for more than three months, AT and T will cancel your service. Yeah, they'll say yeah. yeah. Your phone, that phone actually has to like physically show up back in the network, register to a that tower, sucks. and then come back. Yeah, but I have I have friends that live in the that lived in the states, moved back to Canada, and didn't get rid of their cell service because they're like dude it's like five bucks a month i can't get rid of this fucking yeah. plan and they managed to keep it i don't know how but what i'm thinking I, I don't is know like, how, how do you either. life just... hack that how do you geo hack i'd imagine uh, there's got to the be a monopoly hack. that these yeah. dorks have on all of our cell phone signals and our internet like you can't yeah i got back from europe once and every time i go to europe i get a euro sim because it's 30 bucks and you get unlimited data like okay <laughs> sure i'm not even going to pay the 12 15 dollars a day that rogers is going to charge me to roam i'm going to take mm -hmm. my sim out walk into out of the airport and there's all the stores and be like hi one sim card please he's like here yeah. you go here's your sim card for 30 euros and here's unlimited data but i welcome to uber mobile yeah like, <laughs> 
Well, <laughs> I've forgotten to take it out when I've come to Canada, and I've gotten a message like 24 hours later being like, hey, do you know you're in Canada right now? I'm like, oh, right, sorry. <laughs> take that SIM card out. Put the wrong <laughs> no, I'm high as tits. I didn't know I was in Canada. The fuck did I get sorry. here? <laughs> Forgot. <laughs> I just was on a transatlantic flight. Give me a break. <laughs> like, it's just... Uh, it's it's totally different, totally different attitude to it. I said this to you guys yesterday. I was in Europe when there was an outage from, mm-hmm. the, ca- from yeah. the carrier, a pretty big one, actually, uh, that affected the Irish carrier that I mentioned earlier. All of Europe was down. Whoever was on it. Nobody was freaking out. People were just like I, people. We walked by like a shop for Vodafone. There were some people in there just switching out their sims. They're like, we're with them now. It's like, OK, <laughs> like, yeah, super easy. Yeah. And you just prepay for it too. Like, you can yeah. give me uh, here's thirty bucks, and you're good for the trip. And I was you in move Germany your number years ago, just like we can do. You port yeah. your number over. I was in Germany. I'm like, what are the roaming charges? Like, yeah. Rogers, like, great deal. It's only going to cost you ten grand the whole trip. I'm like, <laughs> that's a lot. Ten of money. grand, they do, they and sell- we need a deposit. Like, yeah, uh, they sell it then, to you like that. Yeah, and then when I when I got there, I walked into this this Vodafone store. Same thing. It was in Lanzhou, Germany, and I'm like, hey, how much for like. Free internet, free roaming, all that shit for the whole week. He's like, "How long are you gonna be here?" I'm like ten days. He's like, seventy bucks. I'm like, "What does it get me?" He goes, "You won't even use it all. It's crazy how much." It He's like, "We're the best at this. Canada sucks." And I'm like, "All right, sure enough." I like, I've surfed for free, did everything for free, came back, and when I came back, Rogers is like, "We noticed interruption with your service." I'm like, "Yeah, because if I used your service when I was over there, I would have come back because it did happen to me once with for a bill of sixteen thousand dollars." Yeah. Which happened because two years before that, I went to Ireland, England, Germany, and I was doing business, taking screenshots, taking phone calls, and sending people emails, sending people pictures, videos, <laughs> live streaming, all that stuff. Like <laughs> FaceTime. And, like, and then Rogers cut off my service like five days into my trip. I'm like, what's well, like, dude, your bill's like 16 grand. And I'm like, well, aren't you a bunch of fuckers? No, like, shit, why didn't though. you tell me about this? Why do you say, well, you should, well, retroactively, he's only got to give us 1500. I'm like, how about you go fuck yourself? I'm not paying you a dime. <laughs> and then there was like this VIP service, which we were part of at the time. They're like, okay, we won't charge you for any of it, but you, you, you can't use your, your cell phone when you go over there normally because that's where we really get people, just so Jesus you know. Christ. And I'm like, no shit. So two years later, I go over, I get a little SIM card, and I'm like, ah, I'm good for the whole month. It was like 30, 40 bucks or something like that. It was crazy. So I we're pay- you're paying for you're paying for nothing. You're paying for a, for a digital fucking pulse in the air, and that's that's kind of what it's down to. And, and I get it; it's a commodity now. But if that's the case, this country needs to figure it out and figure out how to treat it like a an actual resource, like a utility. I don't and even know why they even bother like, like doing commercials. No, we like you guys. Like, why even bother advertising? Yeah. No. And you know why? It's because everybody knows they're full of shit and they don't give a shit about any of their customers. Bell, Rogers, tell us none of it. That's why they put animals in their commercials. They're like, oh, people fucking hate us. Let's put a bunch of monkeys and some puppies. Let's, let's, bunnies. Yeah. Yeah. let's put bunnies. So I just took a look. Um, <laughs> Europe, right now, if you walked into an, uh, the Irish airport in Dublin and said, I need a SIM card, 20 euros gives you unlimited calls, text, and data for the entire European Union. Like how much? Twenty, 20 euros. euro. Jesus Which wait, like no, forty five bucks. Sale. That's on sale. It was thirty. Now it's twenty. So saving the big bucks there. Unfucking believable, <laughs> man. Like <laughs> seriously, like what are we doing? It's a joke. Ah, <laughs> oh, what a country, huh? But they're like, oh, this is a pretty free country, though. Look over there. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jingle the keys and hey, look my, at my, shiny things. My cell phone doesn't work. Neither does my internet. Yeah, that's great. But look at that over there. <laughs> can you believe this convoy? Yeah. Oh, it's hard to believe, isn't it? Hey, Unreal can we man. watch this one clip one more time before I let you guys go? Yes, please. Just watch it one more time. Your company is pushing a merger with Shaw that would further monopolize the market. How much responsibility does your company bear for the sheer number of Canadians who are affected by this? I, I can't get into discussions on the merger with Shaw. Um, we, we're so focused on recovering the situation here, so I, 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 I couldn't possibly comment on that. What about the degree to which the market is monopolized, though? That is something that your company has lobbied, you know, for years. I can't talk about the monopolization in, in Canada right now. I'm focused on the recovery efforts, as you can imagine, right? So you're, you're keeping me I'm from sorry, the we're incident room. So. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I do understand that, sir. I'm just asking on behalf of Canadians. Thank you. 
<laughs> like I was looking through his fake background for an exit. I yeah. get out of here. <laughs> just, just step over the hamster wheel and the 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 Duracell batteries to charge yeah. the network. That is one confused Welshman. That's the most confused Welshman I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> you know, uh, I you know I don't feel sorry for Rogers and the shit kicking they're taking because of how transparent they don't have to be. Take from that with what you will. Do yeah. I believe they're lying about everything? Fucking rights, I do. I believe that Bell and Rogers and Tellus lie to you every day so they can keep their hands in your bank account and keep you paying three times, four times what everybody else pays around the world. That's what I think. That's just my opinion. Take it for what you will. I give them $400 a month of my money. I can shit on them all I want. That's 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 my opinion on it. So This guy's face (laughs) is, that is like, if you talk to a Rogers employee in any of their divisions, that's their face today. I I think that's their face all the time. Uh, that was my fuck. face when I was in that building all day. Like that's what I looked like. Uh, too. Fuck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't disagree. I, the, the, I actually like. I felt uncomfortable watching him try to answer those I questions. I did, dude. He all he's doing is like, all he's trying to do is keep the lights on, keep his family fed. All he's trying to do is like, and you could. He's like, dude, we're trying so hard to recover. Did you hear him go? We're trying to recover it. We're yeah. Trying to recover. What are you recovering? He what just finished his turn cranking the wheel of the emergency <laughs> generator to keep the lights on. <laughs> Listen, lady, my wife is at home with our six-year-old who hasn't been able to play Angry Birds all fucking yeah. morning. We're on Rogers 2. I have problems myself. Get off my ass. Yeah, you know what he was doing? Flashlights? You know what <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what that look is? It's like, not only is my entire job redundant because we're completely off the internet and no one can make a phone call, but my wife just called and my daughter can't watch any uh, any of her shows. That's right. And you know what? Clubhouse. So, <laughs> if you no think you got fucking home. problems, lady. <laughs> yeah. Well, you talked to my wife at home who just called me and said the kid can't use her fucking iPad and I got a hair appointment. <laughs> <laughs> that's why he's she actually can't use her tab. Not, not 14 million people across Canada not having internet. That's his point of stress. Yeah, is the, it. Is the, is the, is the uh, messages he's getting from his wife who's probably on yeah. TELUS because she doesn't actually love him. So, <laughs> Guys, I'm almost certain this is the longest podcast I've ever done. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know what? You're almost three hours in. Holy yeah. shit, Dean. I know. Well, it's Monday. Take, take it easy for the rest of the week. Just another manic Monday. Oh, Tell me why boy. I don't like Mondays. Wish it was Sunday. Oh, oh. That's I'd have my fun Monday. Day. Day. Just another manic Monday. By the way, I am uh, in the market for a new cell phone and a new cell phone provider. <laughs> as we are as a network, we're switching over. Yeah. So yeah. if you're in the cell phone business and you are not attached to any one of the majors, so oh, nobody. <laughs> so is nobody. There not one. There's nobody. Give There's us a no call, Uter Mobile from Germany. Uter Mobile. <laughs> yeah, no, we're screwed. We're all screwed. Yeah, we are. Isn't it? We're all screwed. And you know what? We put the be- we take the bytes out of the terabytes. Call us. <laughs> <laughs> who who are you gonna bend over for this month? That's basically what it is. It's well, I don't like. Part of yeah, it is like much. I know how many people are probably on the phone. Like, can you imagine being a Rogers telemarketing rep today, dude? People were calling nine one one to ask them when the fucking internet was coming back on. I can't imagine being a customer service representative for Rogers or Bell. Like, I couldn't. But yeah, you know I would. I would. Can... I would. I would say I have COVID this week if I did yeah. that job. I'm like, oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> make it. <laughs> I would I'm give out. myself COVID for the week. Yeah. Yeah, go lick some lick some doorknobs in Calgary or something like that to get COVID. <laughs> go breathe heavily through my mouth at the Stampede this week. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for everyone asking, the, you I'm know wearing, how they go? They're like, "We're going to record this phone call uh, for training purposes only." I want yeah. those training purposes phone call from today's call oh center. Oh my god! Yeah, that's you imagine great that content would be. I would I would make an entire vertical out of it. We could would, monetize the yep. shit out of that. You, you make an entire podcast without any sort of any just talk, phone just phone for calls. like seven years too. Like just yep. you would have seven years of <laughs> daily episodes of just like Gladys calling in for her credit, like yep. just freaking out that she only gets three dollars, oh. like. <sighs> It's, I love it so much. Yeah, it's a shame. Yeah. It's a real Un- shame. 
Unbelievable. Not us, but I thought it was funny. Anyway, thanks, boys. Thanks. Appreciate you doing it's this. It's great to see you guys. Yeah. It Again. is great to see you too. Like I just saw you guys yesterday. Yeah. You did. Yeah. How was the barbecue? We had a great barbecue here. Tangibly, yesterday. we saw each other. Tangibly, physically, we actually were able to touch. The, the, the train ride home was an was an adventure, but that yeah, because you were high. Because I was high, so I just, <laughs> the go train was moving quite slow, but it was actually probably moving at normal speed. So I was, yeah, it's good. Felt good. You're a little guy too. You had one yeah. like I, we took a picture. You can go and look at it uh, at Sheep King JB at Ryan Lindley at, at Steam Blundell. You can see it on all our socials. Your book ended between a couple of bears. Just letting you know. <laughs> <laughs> I like my one friend who said, uh, "Oh, JB looks so grown up with his dad's." <laughs> We were a we were a new nuclear family, weren't we? In that yeah. photo, <laughs> yeah, we no, were. I don't even care what people think. Uh, anyway, follow our friend at JB Sheep Sheep King JB at Sheep King JB on any socials as well. You can uh, subscribe to his podcast as well. Uh, wherever you get your fine podcast, audio, visual, right here at DeanBlundell dot com. You can also follow Ryan at Ryan Lilly on Twitter. And you can follow his podcast, subscribe to it. It is the Sheeple Shepherd Podcast, wherever you get your fine podcasts. Thanks, boys. Really appreciate you doing this. We'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, see you. Thanks, pal. I'll see you guys next week. Because I'm, I'm see you next week. week. Yeah, you're working all week. You told me yeah. that in your thing, didn't you? Yeah, Mac. No, it yeah. should be available next Monday. So. Yeah. Well, that's okay. We got a big show well, tomorrow too, because uh, Marianne will be here tomorrow. Uh, Scotty will be here tomorrow, and then I believe uh, we got a heater on Wednesday too. And I'm trying to think of who we're going to have on on Wednesday. It was going to be a lot of fun. We talked about it yesterday. I can't remember who it was. Yeah, yeah. Wednesday was a we big did. day. I don't remember. Who were we either. talking to on Wednesday? I'm gonna have to go through my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I love, I love this. All the information from today pushed all the information for tomorrow. Way it was up. a good show, man. It yeah. was so good today. I, I, I can't wait to actually get that book. I want, and I didn't even know you had a hard copy. And now that I see it, I saw it on your desk when I was at the house yesterday, and I should have leaved through it yesterday. I flipped through it. It's fantastic. It's, yeah, it's it looks awesome. really good. It, the, the the actual photos are insane. Yeah, yeah, it's intense. If you yeah, he said it's like twenty five to... years in the making. It, it took to do that, eh? Like, good for him. Verissimus. I know that I need to put my mirroring on. So yeah, relax everybody. But uh, this is the actual thing. And by the in the in the uh, comments or in the description of the podcast. All the stuff, all the attachments to Donald, Donald's uh, personal website, uh, Modern Stoicism, of course, the ability to purchase this book. It's called Verissimus. It lands tomorrow. You can pre-order it, but it's available widely uh, anywhere you get your your books, uh, Indigo Chapters, online, Amazon, Kindle. It's an editor's pick, actually, on Amazon as well. It's already made it to the front page of Amazon. Mm. It's the day before it comes out. So it's a big deal. It's uh, really cool if you want to have a look at it. Uh, Follow these guys as well. We'll talk to you guys soon. Really appreciate you being here. Ciao, boys. See you. Take care, fellas. Uh, That's the guys. That's me. That was Donald J. Robinson. Thank you very much, Donald, for being on the program as well. Don't forget to purchase his book called Verismus, if you're interested. Stoic philosophy, cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, The original psycho psychology. The original psychology. Stoicism is the original psychology and psychotherapy as well. Check it out. I love it. You should too. And if you don't, no big deal. I don't care. Works for me. Doesn't work for you. That's cool too. No religion. No obligation, no tithe, no membership, no nothing. Just you being your best version of yourself. So thanks to Donald for being on. I appreciate it. Have a wonderful day, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks to our friends at Kivlaw. Go to kivlaw.ca if you're in trouble with the law or if you just need someone to walk you through a legal process that you find incredibly difficult. Uh, if you have securities issues, if you're getting a divorce, if uh, something has happened to you and you need help navigating the legal system, Rob is a wonderful human being. And that's why we do business with him, as a matter of fact. Uh, we wouldn't get into business with people that lie or people that are just in it for retainer or money. Rob wants to walk you through being a better human being. Uh, and he does that through the legal system. So where where that is concerned, make sure you get in touch with them. If you've got a problem, issue, or you need to be walked through, or you don't uh, want to give up your life and want to get your life back, uh, and you're facing some legal issues, his team at kivlaw.ca, again, kivlaw.ca, uh, will help you through it. Robert at kivlaw.ca. Follow him on Twitter as well, at kivlaw on Twitter. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Really appreciate it. We'll see you tomorrow on this very program. Uh, don't forget, tip your waiter or waitress. <laughs> I know you. I, listen, are you in a restaurant? I don't know. But if you are in a restaurant, don't forget to tip your waiter and waitress. Unless the service totally sucked, then just dine and dash. That's how you do that. If the food sucked and the service sucked. Do the old, I'll be right back. I'm going to go to the bathroom. 
and you just don't show up. And they're like, where'd that guy go? It's the longest shit of his life. He's been gone for like four days. Think he's coming back to pay the bill? No. No, he dined and dashed. Like, if you think a dude <laughs> that didn't pay his bill is still in the bathroom, he's gone, man. He's gone. Bye.